Looking across a slightly hazy area of northern France here as we head now towards Roubaix on the classic one-day event Paris-Roubaix, the race we call the Queen of the Classics. I'm Phil Liggett, alongside me is Paul Sherwin, the 1st of April 2012. This is the Paris-Roubaix Challenge, Paul, which all began uh, the week before the race, unfortunately clashing with the Tour de Flanders as well. And a foretaste for many of what we call the cyclo sportives as they head for the very same velodrome here as they do in the main event, which is where we're waiting now to join live pictures. Well, this is the race route, a fairly standard race route, uh, the first uh, 60 miles or 100 kilometres before they get to the 27 section of cobblestones that the riders will face this afternoon. As always, for me, the, the most very dangerous one is, of course, once they've circumnavigated Valenciennes and they'll hit the five-star rated forest of Arenberg. A little bit later on, they continue in a westerly direction to go to the cobblestone section of mons en pavel But anybody who wants to win this bike race, Phil, they know that the big place to make the move is at the final Carrefour de l'Abre, which is the cobblestone section at four to go before finishing on the velodrome in Roubaix. And as you can see from the race route in kilometres, it is 257 kilometres, exactly the same route as last year. And as always, an early morning breakaway getting clear around the 70 kilometres into those 257 kilometres today. Four minutes and two seconds is the current gap. There are 12 riders in this breakaway, but they've been moving so quickly, Paul, they are averaging almost 48 or 30 miles an hour. Just looking at the front in this uh, group of 12 riders, the rider on the left-hand side there, well, we saw briefly that was Yaroslav Popovich, a former under-23 world road racing champion and a former winner of the under-23 edition of Paris-Roubaix as well. We're into sector 22 now. Remember, on the cobble sectors, we count down from sector 27 to the last section, which comes just before we enter the Roubaix Stadium, where the race is all but a couple of years always finished. It's a very old stadium. It's concrete and it's very exposed, uh, but that's all in keeping with the race today. As we're now on to sector 22 at Capelle sur Caillon uh, here, it's 1.7 kilometres of broken road. There are not too many big names in this leading group of 12 riders. This is what is always called the early morning breakaway. Many teams actually give out the order to their riders to get into this breakaway because then when the race starts to split up towards the end, when we get to the uh, very difficult sections of cobblestones, you'll see the possibility of having teammates a little bit further up the road because it's important in a race like Pyru Bay to have a lot of teammates up alongside you, especially in the crucial stages down towards the end. Just look at the vibration here as we look at the back wheel of uh, the rider in the breakaway at the moment, Vacon Soleil. Van Kiersburg is uh, heading up the breakaway here. It's got away, Popovic, Kenny de Haas. There's, uh, Popovic is the big name in the breakaway today. The others would try to make theirs by staying out front and winning the race, but uh, that's unlikely, although they've held around four minutes now uh, for an awful long way. They're neither going clear nor are they being caught back. Well, Yaroslav Popovic uh, wouldn't have expected to uh, be a man uh, tipped with a chance to win here this afternoon because he theoretically should have been working for Fabian Cancellara, who was robbed of his uh, classic uh, chances this year with a very, very nasty crash last weekend in the Tour of Flanders when he broke his collarbone into four separate places. And I have to say, Phil, the uh, surgery took place the very same evening. He was flown straight out to Basel. He was operated on in the, uh, in the hospital around Bern. And uh, the doctors actually said he could have been back on his bike within 48 hours albeit a little bit painful I would say well I think for uh, for Cancellara now it, it, it really was not his day he had two mechanical problems before he actually fell and broke his collarbone in those four places and I think he'd have to reassess now on a strong Tour de France and maybe uh, concentrate totally on a win in the Olympic Games time trial and or the road race 127.9 kilometres uh, still to go out there today. Four minutes, four seconds. We just had uh, that time come over race radio. 
The road's pretty dry here because Europe had a very strange, uh, I was, we could almost call it a non-winter. And we had a beautiful March, uh, unseasonally warm and sunny. Today it is overcast, there is a hint of rain, there's a 30% chance of rain at the moment, the weather forecasters are telling us. Uh, but the roads will be dusty and as Paul showing alongside me knows uh, he finished in the top 15 in this event a few years ago so many years ago I can't remember how long ago Paul but dust is a real problem isn't it it's a huge problem uh, w any way you go at Paris-Roubaix Phil uh, if it's a wet Paris-Roubaix you've got the problems with the roads being extremely slippery but the dust actually gets into the mechanics and the mechanical part of the bike and the mechanics later on who are in the team cars you probably see them come up alongside and start to spray oil onto the chains just to keep the things ticking over nicely Kenny de Haas here from Lotto uh, taking on board drinks throwing on boards the the used ones uh, he'll be in his element here being a Belgian there's plenty of roads like this in Belgium where he's no doubt training and we're racing towards Belgium of course at this part of northern France next stop from the finishing line it's only about 10 minutes to drive into Belgium from Roubaix and so there'll be a lot of support for the Belgian cyclists here this is the uh, peloton we're seeing now being driven on by the American BMC team here They've got a, a lot of uh, faith in Alessandro Balan today. If they can get him up front before the last few sectors of cobblestones. He rode a superb race last week in the Tour of Flanders. Had to be content with third, but he was an animator of that winning group. Yeah, BMC in the red and black jerseys there, close to the front end of the main field. Uh, they don't only just count on Alessandro Balan, though, Phil, because they've got Tor Hushoft, who's always ridden exceptionally well here at Paris-Roubaix. And, of course, the very, very experienced George Hincapi, who I would think will be the pilot fish for a youngster on the way up from the United States, Taylor Finney, who is also in this very strong American squad. Yes, Taylor Finney, his mum and dad are in town. Uh, his mum was the first ever gold medalist in the Olympic Games for women when they introduced the road race to the Games in 1984. She was named as Connie Carpenter those days, Connie Carpenter Finney now, and uh, her husband, uh, uh, Davis Finney, he also got placed uh, in the team time trial with a third and also a fifth in the road race so he had a, they had a wonderful game now what's happened here a fall in the middle now this is so typical of Paris-Roubaix somebody's hit a wrong corner there and they've gone down liquid gas rider yeah, Tom Stamschneider, in fact, went down there as well for uh, Team Argos Shimano. That's uh, a new team, and uh, he went down it very, very hard. I have to say his dad was a great cyclocross rider, Henny Stamschneider, and uh, they went down very, 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 very badly there, I'd have to say. And uh, the rider lying down on the top there is uh, Guillaume Blou, the French rider on the Breton Schuller team. He also hurt his back, I think, on those cobblestones. This is so often reminds me, Paul, of the great British horse race, the Grand National, where it's usually the horses that don't fall uh, fight out the finish, and there's only a few left by the end. And that, as we hit these sectors of cobblestones, we keep losing one or two riders. Well, that's, Phil, why it's so very important to, in this part of the race to, to try and get into the cobblestone section in the first 10 to 15 places because the accidents happen a little bit further back when guys are not paying attention. Then all of a sudden, somebody clips the cobblestones badly and goes down, and all of a sudden, you're no longer in the bike race. Well, and welcoming viewers from around the world watching these pictures here Australia, South Africa, the United States, and Great Britain. Uh, I can tell you that uh, this is proving to be quite a stubborn breakaway here. Four minutes and ten seconds at the moment. Absolutely no losses or gains by those 12 riders up front. Uh, but it looks as though they're getting a little bit more agitated at the head of the peloton. And yes, it is the Spring Classic, the Queen of the Classics. They call it the Easter Race. And by its place in the calendar this year, here it is, Easter Sunday in northern France. Yes, yeah, so a lot of people will be out there looking for their Easter eggs, I would think, this afternoon. Team Sky are looking for a victory here, Phil, because you can see the black and blue jerseys of Team Sky on the front end of the peloton, and that will obviously be for Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's hoping to be the first Spanish rider ever to win Paris-Roubaix. This is uh, Alec Sadamotins of the Latvian uh, Cofferty squad. Well, it's a French team, he's from Latvia. Uh, going off and that looked like a Guillaume van Kiersburg just slipping off the back too he's the youngster on the Amiga uh, Farmer Lotto team Merci Frédéric Gaydam well he's been in trouble today Frédéric past winner of the race he's had a flat tyre he's got back into the peloton but he's retiring today and he's chosen this race which was uh, providing with his happiest memories a few years ago in the 90s well actually 15 years ago to the day in fact Phil, yeah. when Frederic Guedon got himself uh, that victory and uh, he's had a couple of uh, great victories he won Paris Tours a couple of seasons ago as well as you can see it's still Team Sky doing the pacemaking and we're pretty much locked in at that four minute mark I don't 
think we'll start to see any changes in that time gap, Phil, until we start to get to the Forest of Arenberg as these riders now complete section number 22 to go. Sector 22 as we continue now and the breakaway is rather shaking out the riders under its own volition it appears just at the moment. Frederick Gadon by the way determined to ride this race he crashed pretty heavily in the Santos Tour Down Under in January in Australia and fractured uh, his hip um, but he was determined to come back and he's made it incredible tenacity. You might just notice at the end of all of these cobblestone sections uh, the teams actually have a, an unofficial service uh, pit it's not actually uh, it's not actually legal but most of the teams because of the nature of Paris Roubaix they send service cars to the end of the long section of cobblestones because if you have a flat tire on one of these sections of cobblestones you could find your team car being four or five minutes behind so if you have a flat tire on the cobbles you keep riding on the rim till you get to the end of the cobblestone section and hope that your mechanics are there Grisha Janowski the German net app rider just popped out of our picture there there he is uh, in the blue sleeves Yaroslav Popovic in his black Nissan Radio Shack squad colours they're all looking pretty solid now they come off that sector of cobblestones again we can give you a full list of the riders in the breakaway now they're not names we regularly call uh, they are the domestics escaping to glory just now and they got away after a very fast first hour of racing and their average speed now is running around about 25 minutes ahead of expected arrival time so they're going quickly today yeah, it's a big breakaway too. Uh, very often they don't like to allow a big breakaway to get clear because they reckon a, a breakaway like that has got much more of a chance of success. I notice Omega Farmer Quickstep have managed to put a man in this breakaway. He's obviously thinking about Tom Bonin later in the race. Bonin on some incredible form after taking a very dominant victory last week in the Tour of Flanders. Gendarme in the centre there, warning of that reservation because they're, they're really pro bicycle race traps those things so they're not sighted by the riders in the middle of the peloton and as a result there's been some rather nasty incidences amongst the riders sitting in the middle there the tall rider in the blue and white jersey with the blue helmet that's last year's winner Johan van Sommeren a little bit of a surprise but uh, the team have rallied around him Phil there he's finished in the top 10 including his victory in Paris Bay on three occasions so they believe that he's a specialist for this event today yeah fifth eight does oh, crash on the again. corner and that's a lamprey rider I mean there's no reason to fall off on that corner Paul it's just quite routine by the look of it he must have just slipped on the soil on the uh, it's dust on the road it's nervousness Phil that all of these riders they know as the sections of cobblestone start to become uh, much more repetitive in fact he, yep. he was he, it, the, the wheels just came from underneath his bike there and and uh, he just couldn't control it once you lose the front wheel it's very very difficult to keep a bike upright you can usually correct if the back wheel slides but certainly not if the front one goes now on the far right is the team of Filippo Pazzato here who rode to a fine second place last week in the Tour of Flanders and said he would love to be in the mix again when he gets to the stadium at Roubaix I would suggest that he's indicated to his team that they should move nearer the front here and start picking up the pace this is uh quick look here at uh, Andre Greipel number 81 a very prolific winner in the early part of this season a great sprinter and a man who could come up with a bit of a surprise victory here this afternoon he's uh, a tough bike rider and that's what you need to be to ride well in Paris-Roubaix yes Greipel uh, not really found his form it slipped away from him he won a couple of stages in the Tour of Oman in February and then he sort of has had real trouble he's found the other sprinters getting finding their summer legs but he had an absolutely brilliant um, and I must say again another brilliant Santos tour down under he won the down under classic which says a couple of days before the actual stage race itself and then he was in and out of the leaders jersey on a couple of occasions he also netted uh, three stage wins as well he is uh, a tremendous bike rider a very good sprinter but I somehow feel that this isn't his style of race these cobblestones don't suit him well we'll see that a little bit later on you might notice as well the police outriders in Paris-Roubaix use a different kind of uh, bike than the one they normally use in races like the Tour de France in the Tour de France they use great big BMW cruisers but here they actually use a, a cross bike because of the, the nature of the races that they have to go over and the course that they have to go over pretty dodgy roads on a number of occasions yes and when we're not on cobblestones we're on very narrow country roads here in this part of France very nice for a bicycle ride on a quiet Sunday but not the day of Paris-Roubaix these boys mean business here and Popovic uh, in this breakaway will drive it as far as he can to make the field react to chase him down and try and weaken some of the team riders and maybe 
things will swing his way or his team's way towards the finish. That's Popovic wearing number 66, a former under-23 champion of the world. He is uh, given the wild card really because this is a team that's been there decapitated, I would say, because of the loss of their man Fabian Cancellara, who will have banked nearly all of the early mm. part of his season, Phil, on this week of racing, Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. And uh, how unfortunate it was for him and for the team for him to crash out uh, just last week with a very yeah. nasty break to his collarbone. But I tell you what, the doctors did an incredible job of putting that back together with a pin that went right the way down through the collarbone. And they reckon it'll heal up and it'll be stronger than it was before. It looks extremely neat. We had the privilege of seeing the X-rays and a big long pin right down the centre. You know, uh, Lady Luck does shine and otherwise on bike riders, that's for sure, because Cancellara uh, certainly was the rider who is the last man to have done the double here, the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. And here we are, he crashed in the Tour of Flanders now this year. He did that in 2010. Two years later, crashes in the Tour of Flanders, doesn't ride in Paris-Roubaix. 103 just over on the far side uh, from the Vacon Soleil team from Holland and that of course is uh, Stein de Volder. He's a man who uh, needs to come back to a little bit of form I'd have to say a little bit later on. You can hear the squealing there of the brakes as these riders come around this corner and that's because uh, one or two teams have decided to use carbon fibre wheels on a race like this. In fact, uh, I find the carbon fibre wheels just a little bit too rigid for the kind of road conditions that many of these riders will be going on, but some guys, they like to take that extra risk and have the rigidity of a stiff front wheel. 120 kilometres, or that's 62, 75 miles approximately to the finish as well for the riders now. Still a long way to go, plenty of time to sort it all out. We still have in front of us the major... Uh, challenges of the day, the Orenberg Forest, the Mons en Pevelle and the Carrefour de Labe. They are absolute brutes and the last one coming just two kilometres or just over a mile from the finish. There's the huge peloton which set off. At the start today there were 195 in that pack representing the 25 best teams in the world. The one ride I always tell the story of is Bernard Eno, the five times winner of the Tour de France, the great Frenchman on his first Tour de France back in 1978. He hated this event and he thought the best protest he could make uh, would be to win it and then tell the organisers why he'd never come back and ride it again. He did that and guess who organises the race now, Paul? Well, he's involved. <laughs> he's involved with the organisation of the Correct, race to yeah. this day. And uh, I do remember him winning that Paris-Roubaix field because he was actually the world champion at the time. And what a way to win Paris-Roubaix with the world champion's jersey on your back. Yes, that must have been in 1980. He won his title in Solange. Uh, so he would have won the following year, 81 I guess 4.39, 119 kilometres left now beautiful agricultural area of Francis it's such a diverse country, we're right up in the north beneath the borders of Belgium is where we're racing uh, this course zigzags its way to Roubaix you can drive from Compiègne to Roubaix in about an hour and a half uh, but these boys make the distance up to 257 kilometres uh, so it's uh, they just about turn left and right at every junction. Well, we're on the next section of cobblestones for the leading group of 12 riders. This is the uh, the start of the cobblestone section of Artre à Presseau. It's a section of 1.8 kilometres in length, and it comes with a two-star rating. 4.43 the gap. So for the moment, they are keeping on the pressure, and it's nudging out just that little bit. So it's the right way to go. I think the first showdown will come as the riders race in. Uh, to the forest of Arenberg. This is now sector 21. Alnoy, five star rating here. Well, this is a long section of cobblestones, Phil. In fact, it's uh, two sections of cobblestones actually bolted together, one at 1.8 kilometres long and the other 2.6 kilometres long, making it uh, almost five kilometres or three miles in length. FDJ is the team on the front, that's David Boucher, and he actually lives not too far away, Phil, from, uh, from the finishing town of, uh, of Roubaix because he's from uh, a small town called Fourmi, where they have a very big race down towards the end of the year. It's a Grand Prix Fourmi, is, uh, it's a big race in this area, but they love the cycling here. I think it all comes a little bit of a bleed over from Belgium, which is the real hotbed of cycling of this nature. 
And Chris the fellas Sutton. on, yeah, Chris Sutton has been doing a lot of work. The Australian on the far right there in the black. Yeah, they'll be thinking obviously about uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. But a, a, a little bit of a wild card, I'd have to say, for Team Sky Pro Cycling is uh, it's got to be Bernie Eisel because Bernie Eisel uh, spends the majority of his year looking after Mark Cavendish in the sprints. But he has won a one-day classic in the past. He's a former winner of the Ghent Wevelgem race, and uh, given his chances on a day like this, he could come up with the goods. When you look down from the helicopter like this, you can see the speed of these riders, the concentration required by the riders in the middle of the pack because of the constant change of direction. They'll be unsighted, and uh, there are many pitfalls on Paris-Roubaix, as we will see shortly as we move on to the rapid approach of the tough sections of Broken Road. There were roads used by Napoleon's army a couple of hundred years ago, and they're more or less untouched, and they are protected now by law, uh, so they can't be improved either. <laughs> Well, they, they, can't be, uh, they can't be degraded either or covered over. In fact, the one section uh, that I really get excited about is the Forest of Arenberg, and that comes up at, at around about 85 kilometres to go to the finish, or 53 miles of racing. And that section is three kilometres long. The riders go down at an infernal pace. And a couple of years ago, Johan Museo actually crashed there. And because of the fact that the road is closed for all of the year and only open for Paris-Roubaix, uh, the roads are very, very dirty indeed, and he got a very serious infection in his knee. And if his wife hadn't actually been a, a nurse and realised what was happening to him, he could have passed away overnight. And Johan is here today, but he's at the finishing line, one of the few riders to have won this race on three occasions. Uh, Tom Bonan is another one. He is in the race, and he's, I think, everybody's favourite to, to win today, but that's easier to say than to do. Tom Bonan, the winner back in... Uh, 05, 08 and 09. If he does win today, he joins the legendary man we always call the Giton, the Gypsy, Roger de Vlaminck, uh, who won in 72, 74, 75 and 1977. Uh, so four is the record and the only man that can reach him today is Tom Bonan. Just a quick note there, you see the new uh, jerseys there in the uh, black and yellow and green strip that's a uh, the got the uh, green edge team in second position in that line of three riders is Stuart O'Grady former winner of this bike race for Australia as well yes the only Australian to win this bike race and how good w it was when Stewie got back to that leading group and suddenly appeared on his own going for gold it was a great day out so back in 2007 and they've had a very successful world cycling championships on the track currently ending uh, in Australia now with a wonderful clash of the greats Great Britain versus Australia uh, and I think uh, that mini Olympic clash in Melbourne will be uh, was a rehearsal for what will happen in London uh, in August Got a bit of busy, busy cycling season this year straight off the back end of the Tour de France many of the riders participating in the Tour will be on the Eurostar train I would think Phil overnight <laughs> to get themselves into London for the uh, opening day's road race Yaroslav Popovic He's been a great star throughout his career, he developed uh, really through the Lance Armstrong era into a very good helper, but in his own right he's finished on the podium of the Giro d'Italia. Yes, uh, and on the podium of the Tour de France too, and once uh, Lance Armstrong used to be a deadly rival of Janosak Popovic, but now they've, they've finished their career on the same team, or at least Lance finished his career on the same team. Still moving ahead, a little bit surprised at this, Team Sky have got control of the head of the field, this is the British team, and they're having a very, very good season at the moment, Team Sky. Their hopes today, I would suspect, are being pinned on their leader, number 51, your one, Antonio Fletcher, a terrific bike rider, particularly in these spring classics, which is very unusual uh, for a Spanish cyclist to be so good at these one-day classic races here. Yeah, very often the Spanish have always uh, shied away from uh, these northern classics like the Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix, uh, much more suited to races like Liège, Baston Liège, or the Amstel Gold Race. But Juan Antonio Fletcher, whether it's the the Omloop Het Newsblad at the start of the year or whether it's Paris Roubaix, he is always present and correct, and is extremely motivated for races like these. And so they're building their hopes around him. He's uh, three times been on the podium here in the velodrome. He's had a second and two thirds in Paris Roubaix. Uh, but the last Spanish cyclist, by the way, ever to... Uh, with a, rather, the, there was no last Spanish cyclist. There's been no Spanish cyclist win this race. Uh, Fletcher uh, is the rider with the best finish with his second places. 
He has been so close on a number of occasions. And again, I think today he'll be looking to the team to rally around him. You can actually now start to see all the same coloured jerseys getting themselves together. There's a big block of Garmin Barracuda riders there. They're rallying around their man, Johan van Sommeren, who was the winner of this race last year, albeit somewhat of a surprise, after the early morning breakaway succeeded. Leading on to the cobblestones now, this breakaway, which still seems to be working together. They do string out a bit on the cobblestones. They chase each other's wheels over the cobbles. It's the NetApp rider in the blue to the right. This is a team which has really found its feet in the last two years. It's a computer-sponsored team, software team, as they get themselves onto the front again. This is David and Boucher sitting on the back, 113 for the, the FDJ Big Mac squad. With their rider, Frédéric Guédon, riding his last professional race, former winner of this race, 15 years ago, Frédéric Guédon, retiring at the age of 40. Well, let's hope he gets the finish in, uh, in Roubaix today, because uh, that's a fitting way to say goodbye. He's been, hasn't had many wins in his career, but boy, he's chosen some good ones. A little bit of a warning for the left-hand turn there, which is rather nice by Alec uh, Salamotins of Latvia as we go on to Sector 21. Again, five more stars here. Well, this, this group, Phil, is extremely organised and uh, I'm a little surprised to see them uh, nudging out their advantage again. Uh, in the main field, they'll start to feel a little bit concerned, especially with the fact that that is uh, nudging up towards the five-minute mark. But we'll see the peloton really start their acceleration, not for another 40 kilometres or so, I would expect. Once they start to get towards the forest of Ehrenberg, that's when we're going to start to see the big teams start to light the fires under their, uh, under their teammates. The Italian flag flying across the open landscape here of the Department de Nord Pas de Calais. 4.43. This is a five-star sector. It's added on to the previous sector with that just uh, small stretch of good pavement in between. But just take a look at these riders now battling just fine. Even sand will do in preference to the cobbles. Anything you can do to avoid riding on those cobblestones, which is exactly what this rider is doing here, the Kofidis rider. He's actually a Latvian rider, Alexis Saramotins of Kofidis. They're pretty much racing on home turf because their, uh, their main offices, their uh, siege social, if you like, is based just down the road from where we're sitting, Phil, in, uh, in Roubaix as well. Yes, the credit by telephone is what the company does. And they're just sending us the tele telepathy there is uh, Saramotins. I don't know what the roads are like in Latvia, but I can't imagine they're as bad as they are right here at the moment. And he seems to be riding them extremely well indeed. It takes a special knack, and it's also a special way of uh, riding on the bike. You've, uh, you've got to have a really good position. Your centre of gravity's got to be over the back wheel, so your back wheel doesn't bounce too much. This is a fantastic shot here that the French uh, cameras are managed to bring you. You get a chance to see just what sort of a battering the bike is getting. In fact, this guy's wheel is getting lifted off the ground there by the fact that these cobblestones are very nasty indeed. But he's riding them so strongly here, and he's actually getting rid of the other 11 riders, and they've got no way of controlling him. And he's planning on a breakaway to take him to the finish 112 kilometers away, which is about 73 miles. Actually, if you just listen there for a moment, you can actually hear the battering that his bike is taking there. Everything is rattling the bike, the, the chain everything he's riding you see how he's got his hands in the middle of the handlebars there. he's not actually holding those handlebars tight at all he's kind of almost just resting the hands and allowing the front wheel to try and find the smoothest if there is a smooth section of cobblestones as he glides over the top you've got to ride in a big gear keep that big gear ticking over nice and fast and you've also got to try and ride over the cobblestones at speed because actually believe it or not the faster you ride over the cobblestones the smoother they appear to be for the body and just uh, the image there we see of those back tyres too now normally a professional cyclist wouldn't be seen riding such a heavyweight tyre as that it wouldn't be part of his image as we look down for the first time on Tom Bona number 11 and you can see by his tyres too very wide section tyres about 27 millimetres across the top and they're not pumped up as hard as one would normally pump them up to about 80 pounds per square inch instead of 110 uh, Sean Kelly, uh, not commentating not too far away from us, uh, a great rider in Paris-Roubaix, always used to have his tyres very, very soft indeed when it came to a road like this. The, 
disadvantage of riding with softer tyres is the fact that you're more likely to get yourself a flat tyre where the, with a snake bike pinch once you hit something in a bad uh, way. But Kelly was such a clever rider, he used to find the smoothest part over all of the cobblestones. Do you see why it's important to ride at the front there? Briefly you saw anyway, because mm. when you go around the corner you don't lose any momentum like the guys at the back. They're almost like an accordion. They come into the corner fast, they have to slow down to almost stop and then accelerate again. And if you do that repeatedly, you tend to, you tend to start getting very, very tired towards the end of the race. Well, his hand is up here, and I think he's punctured here, uh, Saramotins. That's why he's coming back to the group. He's got a back wheel a puncture by the look of it. As we look at the back wheel of Yaroslav Popovic, we would rather look at the back, and he's off his bike now, the Latvian rider. So, this is what happens. He knew the team was there. He was desperate. Maybe that's why he went off the front, to, to, because he knew there was a pre-selection point here. Well, I think, in fact, I'm not sure that he'd actually had a flat tyre there, Phil. I think what had happened, he'd broken a couple of spokes in that back wheel. But, uh, again, this is why the teams uh, put guys out on these cobblestone sections. If he'd been waiting for the two, well, it's been an awful tyre change anyway. But, you see, there are no cars behind him. There was nobody to look after him. If he waited for the team car, he could have been waiting at the side of the road for two or three minutes. He's got himself back in in about 40 oh, oh my crash. goodness well this is as they just entered the same sector where the leaders are on this has been a blockage of riders coming to a hand still a standstill as one after another they've plowed into each other well there's a lot of guys taken to the field there just to get around the traffic jam there's an uskatel uskadi rider there is another oh. side there's another discipline of the sport phil called uh, cyclocross so you notice one guy's just gone down there and then all of a sudden it's like a bunch of dominoes and some guys in fact going into somebody's courtyard over to the left hand side but there. this is chaos this is Paris Roubaix this is what it's all about it is indeed and this is why it's unfortunate if you are at the back of the field number 128 there is Luke Roberts the Australian rider for Saxo Bank delayed and battling their way through they've got to get themselves back into the action here you see you've got to have a, a morale of steel when you ride a race like this yeah this is a this is a mishap a few guys have got uh, slowed down because of that accident but you've got to fight back you've got to get back into the race number 111 well there he is it's a shame to see Frederick get on there in a position like this he would really like to do something special this afternoon Sebastian Roselaer is the Garmin Barracuda rider wearing number 10 as well he stopped at the side of the road his bike obviously uh, slightly damaged by that mishap now they've got to get going as you can see although this is a very flat area of France they always seem to build these little cobble roads on slight gradients so they've got to get themselves back into it now we're looking at Frederick get on the former winner it's his final race today I don't think he was on the floor there he was just brought to a standstill by the packed melee of riders and he's got to get himself back into this it'll be a tough chase this Paul a very difficult chase because you might have noticed there was a lot of pressure on the front from the black and red jerseys of team BMC racing they were getting themselves organized quickly yet yeah, well done Frederick over to the smooth part of the road on the right hand side there he'll try and uh, lift up the pacemaking as much as he can but he's got to try and make the contact Phil before they get to the end of the cobblestones and look at the dust now that is starting to get thrown up uh, these riders will be making sure they've got their sunglasses on here this afternoon or more likely visors more than anything else because uh, the clouds are quite uh, quite low over the velodrome here in Roubaix and there is always in this part of the world the possibility of a little bit of rainfall in the latter part of the afternoon now if that happens well, it's going to be chaos you can imagine what a dampening of these cobblestones will do it will turn the surface into an ice rink as the riders now are preoccupied at the back to try and regroup there'll be a number of good riders caught in that stoppage and they'll look for teammates to help them back to the leaders at 4 minutes 28 the riders up front are enjoying themselves just now as the clock keeps coming down 109 kilometers to go that's about 70 69 miles to the finish I know that many of you do like me to mention miles as well as kilometers so we'll stay with that well I'm always amazed at how quickly you managed to do the conversion <laughs> Divide by 1.6 if you want to do it yourself at home. That I couldn't do. There's that crash again. Somebody goes into the left-hand side here. Yeah. First of all, that rider on the left, on the right. Then the, the peloton turns left as if to get out of the way. And then they start falling down. Uh, really a mass crash there now. And the reason is, Phil, because a lot of people were really... Uh, they, they were on the rivet there. You can see just on the left-hand side. Get on. Get on with number 111 and everybody's trying to get their bikes fixed and get themselves back into the race while meanwhile the group of 12 riders at the head of affairs they've got no problem at all every time they come into these cobbles they don't have to fight as the guys do in the main field behind uh, as you can see this is coming from uh, the motorbike number one Tête de la Course that's the front end of the bike race
And we caught a glimpse there from the other camera behind, which would be moto number two of Alex Salamotins. He's now back in this leading group. Uh, so I think that was a premeditated wheel change. He communicated, he knew where the change was going to come, and he took his change well. As we now go out, we leave rather, sector 20. Yeah, that was a cobblestone uh, section between uh, Fama and uh, Kerenin. And it's a long section, uh, 1.2 kilometres in the main field. We'll be getting there in a little while. Uh, through the feeding station, taking on board uh, bottles. There's a French national champion there, wearing number 12. Also a pre-race favourite for the uh, Omega Pharma Quick Step team. There's Tom Bonin, number 11, in the pale blue jersey. He really is, for, I think he's come back to the form that he had a couple of years ago when uh, he top and tailed this Classics week by winning uh, not only the Tour of Flanders, but also Paris-Roubaix as well. Yes, and he's got himself right up to the head of this peloton now. Just saw a move there from Heinrich Hausler going up on the right of our picture to the head of the peloton as well. He'll now appear on the left of our picture as we've gone to the front. He's the Garmin Barracuda rider over on the left there in the light blue top. They've moved up to the front now. This is becoming quite serious now. They've got that little crash out the way. They're not going to be at the back again and get caught once more as we're heading towards the forest of Arenberg. 108 kilometres still to ride, 70 miles, slightly less. Taylor Finney going through there for Team BMC Racing. Uh, he was he said he was like a kid in a candy shop. They went for a, a reconnaissance uh, the other day on Thursday, Team BMC Racing, and uh, I was talking to Jim Okovitz, uh, the, the general manager of the squad yesterday, and he said uh, it's amazing how this young kid was uh, floating over the cobblestones, but look what that crash has actually done here, yeah. Phil, because it's caused a massive split in the main field. A long, hard chase for those behind. And here comes the cavalry. All those riders behind there were blocked by that fall and uh, this group is at the front and riding very strongly and that's why Finney's come up here twice a winner of the under 23 the espoir they call it the hope uh, the under 23 rider Finney's won it twice Paris-Roubaix in the same stadium four minutes the gap has come down slightly now as we go to Kerenang well, it's come back to what it was for a long time. From uh, For about 70 kilometres, though, Phil, it's been locked in at that four-minute margin. Uh, but that crash has certainly split this race to pieces. This is what Paris-Roubaix is all about. When you have that back luck, you've got to have the courage and the guts to fight your way back into an event like this. And that's what many of those riders behind will be doing. But you see the problem now is all of the official cars that carry those spare bikes, the team cars, are now shut out of the race because of the crash. If the riders have problems now, they will rely heavily on last night's plan, which would be to put helpers around the course on these sectors of cobbles with broken wheels to replace if they can. The crowd applauding here now as the leading group of 12 are still clear by just under four minutes and that's the first time we've ducked inside four minutes for maybe 60 odd miles I would think. They're working well together still but the gap is on a reverse now. Well the rider in that dark green jersey is the, the Eurocar team uh, rider David Veilleux. The French have got a number of riders into this leading group uh, with uh, David, F David Veilleux as well as uh, David Boucher. They've been very attentive to try and get themselves into that early morning breakaway. It's a, it's a great race, Paris-Roubaix. It really is something very, very special. And I have to admit, Phil, uh, even though we're commentating, I still get nervous when I wake up on the day of Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, I can imagine, because you never know if you will see the other end and whether your bike will be smashed to pieces or indeed whether you will be smashed to pieces by the end. Just passing through the beautiful rapeseed fields there. A little bit uh, late in flowering this year because we had a cold snap just the last couple of weeks it slowed them down normally these fields will be bright yellow at this time of the year as the bells toll but for whom do they toll at the moment BMC are now trying to uh, not just close down on the leaders but hold off that back group that's coming up to them you notice again the team helpers over on the left hand side of the road with spare wheels so this is at the back end of the group, and uh, again, another rider from uh, Team uh, Europe Cup. It's uh, Damien Godin, a French rider on that squad. These section of cobblestones now, Phil, uh, are starting to get longer and longer, but everybody's thinking in the back of their mind about the forest of Arenberg. Three minutes, 47 seconds. The gap is coming down slowly but surely and it's under the impetus now of uh, Team BMC as the rider on the front here, Marcus Berghardt, drives it on 
Well, he's caught me out this week, Phil, because he's in fact got socks over his shoes. You can normally recognise Marcus Burkhardt because he rides in some very, very bright lime green shoes. In fact, one or two of the other riders on his squad now have opted to move across to that shoe sponsor. So, it's going to be a bit confusing for me over the next couple of races. <laughs> Well, I think you do very well to pick anybody out, especially in the next few miles when they'll all be covered in uh, dust and they'll be very hard to identify except by the number and riding style. There is the split. Now, you see, after that crash, you'd have thought they'd have come back pretty quickly. But because of the pressure here by Marcus Burkhardt, Taylor Finney up here, they're driving it on and the split is still there. A lot of energy being expended by the chasing peloton. They also want to make sure that they reduce that gap fill before they get to the Forest of Arenberg, which is uh, the cobblestone section number 16 to go to the finish. 27 sections of these cobblestones are dotted around the last 150 kilometres of Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon. It's a beast of a race. It's a race, uh, it's almost uh, as if you've turned the clock back 100 years and it's still the same thing. It's a question of survival. Your bike's got to survive, your body's got to survive, and with a bit of luck, you've got to manage to try and stay upright. Well, you can hear the sound coming from the bikes, the motorbikes, everybody bouncing the way along here. Padded handlebars, stronger, heavier tyres to try and resist the nature of the beast, which is the puncture bogey, the flat tyre. There's Filippo Pizzato, many people's favourite today after his fine second place finish. But he's not in the right place for the moment, Phil, because he's got to get himself across that little bit of a gap there to reintegrate the front end of the main field. Got caught out, I think, sitting too far back in the main field. I always give this information out to uh, anybody who's prepared to listen. You must ride a bike race like this. It's more important in Paris-Roubaix to hit these cobblestone sections in the first 15 to 20 riders. What a wonderful way to spend Easter Sunday in northern France, watching Paris-Roubaix. The thousands of spectators, the villages are on holiday here and enjoying the sceptical. We're looking down on the peloton now as they crash on to this next sector of cobbles, which they head on. It's uh, sector 19 here and they are 3.35 behind 105 kilometers to go which is some 65 miles from the finish and the breakaway still there but coming down steadily it's now just over three and a half minutes in front well I'll tell you one thing Phil they have really started to pick up the pace very very rapidly now because they're now thinking they're getting into their mindset the forest of Arma you might just notice that bottle on the right hand side of the road you've got to be aware all of the time the best thing to do is to keep an eye on the riders one or two in front of you there's Tom Bonin in that pale blue jersey of powerful, Omega Farmer quick step he really looks comfortable the determination that chain bouncing along but he's riding a heavy gear here high uh, gear Phil one other thing to spot there this is a real bike rider because he's not even wearing any gloves. He doesn't want. To, he wants to feel the bike. He wants to feel the vibrations. Get rid of all that uh, ancillary equipment that you don't need. As long as he doesn't feel the cobblestones if he falls off, because uh, that's one reason they wear gloves to save the palms of their hands when they go down. Here we are now on to sector 18 here, as the riders come under the banner. As they enter rider a sector 18, we are 3 minutes 26 ahead with these 12 riders who have been away for much of the day today. They're hanging on to the lead as we go into 64 kilometres, 64 miles uh, to go to the finish. And Tom Bonin just about getting himself back into the action after we had that little stoppage on the cobblestones about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, this is the leading group of 12 riders. Uh, they built themselves up a maximum advantage one stage of just inside of five minutes. But as we now slowly but surely, Phil, start to make our way to the, the famous cobblestone section, the forest of Arenberg, the space, the speed in the main field is starting to pick up. Just on the right-hand side there, by the way, that is one of the giants of the Flandre Artois. They uh, take these giants around to all of the town fairs around the northern part of France and it's a very big part of the north of France culture. They've seen more Paris-Roubaix than we have, Paul, the giants of Flanders. 3 minutes 18 now, still a lot of work to be done there. There's a little composition of the breakaway, the names are not well-known names. Uh, the biggest name in this breakaway is certainly uh, Yaroslav Popovic, who has also won at the under-23 Paris-Roubaix in years gone by, back in... Uh, the mid uh, early 2000s uh, the back of the break here for the moment Frederic Verkelin the Belgian rider on the Dutch Vacancelet team sunny holidays literally interpreted 
Back in 2001, actually, you can see Popovich over on the right-hand side. He was a world under-23 uh, row racing champion. He was fourth in the world uh, under-23 time trial championships, and he won the Paris-Roubaix under-23 edition that year, too. Now, we're looking down at number 31 there. That is Alessandro Balan. He is what we call the protected rider on the American team BMC today. They're all riding to try and see him win the day for him. At the moment, he's in the peloton, but he's. Uh, and when we get to the head of it, just look at the length of the line here, as they're now so much under pressure. He's a bit far down, I suspect, that uh, Alessandro Balan was delayed by that crash we had about 15, 20 minutes ago. Yeah, he won't be happy about that. But you know, Dean BMC Racing, we've got a lot of riders in the squad here this afternoon who could be given their own chances. And I always think about George Hincapie. Hincapie, for so many years, was uh, one of our big favourites, Port for Perry Roubaix. And uh, he's always been very close to getting himself the victory. Hincapie's uh, just the that was Hincapie, in fact, who just put that bottle into his mouth. And sitting behind him is Tor Hushoff. So, Team BMC Racing in the black and red jerseys there. They've got a lot of riders at the front. And Taylor Finney sitting up there in second position. Well, my goodness me, how American cycling has come on over this past few years. Because the Garmin Barracuda team are right there in those light blue jerseys as well. Albeit with their Australian team member. Heinrich Hausler setting the pace for them. It's goodbye to sector 18 now of 27 sectors of cobblestones today. A total of 51 kilometres. That's around 32 miles of bad roads. Uh, and most of it coming in the next, uh, the remainder of our coverage today. It's still all to be won or lost on the roads that lie ahead. We're now looking at 20 kilometres or 12 miles of racing before we get to that forest of Arenberg. Uh, this is the section 18 for the main field from Main to Montchau sur Ecaillon. Ecaillon, the little river that winds its way around here. A section of cobblestones at 1.6 kilometres, or to put it into old money, a mile long. Team BMC from America is driving the pace at the front with all of the best guns as the split here is slowly but surely coming together. And I think this is where they'll find their team leader, Alessandro Balan. So they should be controlling the front of that lead group till he gets back onto them. He's in this group here, and so too is Filippo Pazzato. Those lime green coloured jerseys down there are the Farnese teammates of Filippo Pazzato. And he is the Italian favourite to try and win today. No Italians won this race from Adri uh, since Adri uh, Adriano Taffi in 1999. Well, BMC Racing at the front, they're obviously very happy with the situation. They're probably not sure, they probably don't know that Alessandro Balan was caught out in that crash. But because of the strength they've got in numbers, they're quite happy to put the hammer down as they realise they want to try and reduce that gap. And it's having a remarkable effect on that gap to the leading group of 12 because now, Phil, for the first time in 70 kilometres, it's come inside of three minutes. Just sitting at the back here, Dutch Rabobank rider, number 26, Dennis Van Winden. The Dutch can ride over cobblestones, they do have cobble roads very much so in Holland, but not quite as bad as these in France just now. There's the French flag fluttering in the breeze, there's not a lot of wind around today, it is slightly overcast and there uh, is a hint of rain but thankfully still dry. Well this uh, front part of the main field is about to get caught there by the peloton but there's still a lot of riders left behind because in fact there's only one car behind this group and that of course is the car of the uh, the race referee, the red car that you'll see just coming into vision in a couple of seconds time. You have to take your hat off too to the police ball and uh, the way they ride these motocross motorbikes uh, in amongst the riders, they're such skilled by, uh, bike handlers themselves uh, because anything can happen at any moment in time. Also, the riders in yellow are actually the official service uh, mechanics because they are neutral service, they carry wheels only, uh, but any rider has a flat tyre of any team and they can take the wheels from those motorbikes. It's the only way you can do it on this course. Well, the problem is that once you have riders getting dropped behind it, the cars can't actually get past at all because the road is so, so narrow that they have to wait for the big pieces of cobblestone, big pieces of road later on. Well, 100 kilometres to go, or 62 and a half miles, the gap, 2 minutes 44. Around that corner, they have actually caught, they caught out the motorbike there as a little bit fill as they came around that corner because uh, the motorbike, the bike riders can go around corners like this a lot faster than the big heavy motorbike machines. I told you it twisted and turned this course, that is almost a complete turnaround to head back home, 242. 
I wouldn't have been that photographer down there because the likelihood would have been the riders would have clipped his camera. Just hear the uh, the back brakes are squealing there as they slow down to, to negotiate around that almost hairpin bend as we rejoin the leading group of 12 riders. 12 riders strong who got clear after about uh, 40 miles of racing this morning and they're now looking at 62 miles to go to the finish, 100 kilometres flat. 11 teams represented in this breakaway of 12 riders. Uh, Vacon Soleil have two men up here, Frederic Verkelin and Benji Lindemann. But uh, the big names have not gone in the early breakaway. History shows that the early breakaway very, very rarely, almost never survives to the finish without being caught by stronger riders from behind. And then it's every man for himself in the last hour of racing. If you've got the legs, you can handle the course have a go for the victory as always the crowd in the Roubaix velodrome being entertained with a large television screen so they know exactly what's heading towards them this breakaway showing no weak links I have to say and that's why it's such hard work for this bunch here to chase them but they have got themselves back together it's been a tough chase for some riders but they're all together now although still under pressure still under the pressure of team BMC racing in those uh, red and black jerseys this really has become one of the super squads I have to say two three squads have become mega squads I would have to say during the transfer season this one we're looking at here BMC racing Oming a farmer quick step has become a very big team as well just look at and, that and of course uh, 50 kilometers an hour I'll translate that for you by the way if you're interested 31 miles an hour we're hammering along here at which is amazing over those roads this is again the net app rider Grisha Janotsky the German rider on the squad as you, when I said there's no passion, as you can see that these riders are helping each other. They're driving at the front uh, just for 100 metres or 100 yards or so. Then they drop back. The next man comes through. In this case, it's David Velleur from Canada, who's now a part of the Europe car team. He drops to the back and so on. And they help each other going forward and through and off. The big rider on the front, uh, Omega Farmer Quickstep. Uh, He's one of the riders who will be looking to help that out with uh, Johan, uh, Tom, Tom Bonin a little bit later on. And here, by the way, is uh, Guillaume van Kiersbulk. There's Pozzato, number 41. Yes. And you see immediately, <laughs> Phil, once that group came back together, he said, wait, I'm not going to get caught out like that again. I'm going to move straight up to the front end because uh, now there's a lot of nervous. Andre Greipel there as well, number 81, moving around the outside while sitting nice and comfortable. Number 11, that's Tom Bonin. Bonin the weight of his shoulders. Himself. He just placed himself so well, he used his strength, he's watching, he's waiting, keeping an eye, this looks like it might be an attack by the Lotto boy. It's not, it. So we are just 98 kilometres from the finish, it's about 60 miles still to race, 2.39 is now the gap and the field has totally regrouped here and they're being uh, just trying to get off the front, it is Andre Greipel who's made a move. Well. Phil, he saw the opportunity, he felt a little bit of a slowing down of these bike riders, so then he decided that uh, he would take the advantage of a slowing down in the peloton. Maybe Greipel is trying to get himself a little bit of a lead before we go to the forest of Arenberg. Very wise man indeed, I think, because that's a cruel stretch of road in the forest. It's not used at all uh, during the year. It is barriered off, no vehicles allowed. It is a place of tranquility, except on the day of Paris-Roubaix. Well, so be sorry, Phil, before he gets to the forest of Arenberg, he's got another long section as well, because uh, before that, you've got the section from Avalui to Wallace, which is 2.5 kilometres long. Now, uh, that's only about three kilometres away from where Andre Greipel is now, but they're not giving him a free ticket this afternoon. So that gap of 2.36 is now to Greipel. The peloton are timed at 2 minutes and 40 seconds, the peloton being the big pack of riders. And as far as we can see, as we get into the bunch with our cameras, all of the favourites are still very much in this pack. Just over to the left-hand side, uh, behind the armada of BMC Racing in the black and uh, red jerseys, you can see the, the, the green and gold, I suppose we would have to call it, Phil, of the Australian Green Edge squad. They're very present at the front end of the peloton. More traps to the right and left of the peloton here. As they, if they come off this uh, tarmac on the roads here, uh, they go into the stones, and it looks as though... Andre said, I'll wait for you now. He probably said, uh, hmm, the wind's in the wrong direction here this afternoon. I'm not going to ride for the next 10 kilometres with the wind smacking straight into the face. I think I'll stay in the main field where it's just a little bit warmer. 
all the work being done by those red and black jerseys of the BMC team from the USA. They really have got faith in their rider Alessandro Balan today, or maybe Tor Hushoft, because Tor Hushoft, the former world champion, has said this is the race he really wants to win before he retires. There is Tom Bonan, who funnily enough has moved to the back of the race, and now he's suddenly put himself back to the front. So he took the smooth stretch of road, he took his opportunity to drop back to the team car. I think he took that advantage Looks to like go he's have a, eating. Yeah, he's got you've got to keep eating and it's very difficult in a race like Paris Roubaix because in fact the only place you can really eat Phil is on the smooth sections of road. So what happens as you use these smooth sections of road to keep the energy levels topped up. He looks extremely relaxed here Bonan, but you watch the way he rides. As soon as he starts to feel the approach of another cobblestone section, he'll scuttle up the ice outside and place himself at the front end of the pack. Having a little bit of a chat there with Tom Lisa from the rival Rabobank team. So all the favourites still together in this large field. We are now inside 60 miles from the finish and the gap is 249. So there's 12 riders now, Phil, they're uh, starting to tick away. They know they're not too far away from the, the next section of cobblestones. I put it around about one kilometre away from here, and that's a 2.5 kilometre section into the uh, area of Wallers, and that's on the other side of the forest of Wallers, Arenberg. This is the breakaway again, all 12 men. Now back to the peloton as they do a little split here. And the wise men are getting through that gap and back into the comparative comfort. Uh oh, oh that's problem. dodgy. There we oh. go just missed the centre barrier now we've just left one low man out on the left and he's in trouble <laughs> so uh, now he's trying to figure out uh, what am I going to do here that's a little bit too high that uh, railing <laughs> in the middle field to bunny hop over the top it's, so uh, uh, Maxime Van Tomme of Belgium who's been caught out and he's going to have to get his way back in that's going to hurt as well uh, there we get a chance to see uh, at the back end of the main field the service cars are now getting themselves back in but that accident that crash we saw a little while back it really has had a big effect on the peloton Yes, because they're still recovering from the hard chase, the vast majority they had. Now the strong riders are taking the opportunity now to get from the back of this pack up to the front and try and keep there as we head down towards the forest of Arenberg. Ricardo Garcia, number 211, just gone through. He's the team leader on the Spanish Euskadel Euskadi team. And as I said earlier, there's never been a Spanish winner of Perry Roubaix. Well, if there, if there is ever going to be one, I'd have to say the name we would utter would be Juan Antonio Fletcher. He loves this race. He's got a very strong squad around him here this afternoon. They're dedicated to him as the team leader this morning. And I think uh, he'll be the one we'll see a lot more of down towards the end. Team Sky has gone to the back as we have another chance to see one of those giants of Flanders. They're dotted along the whole of the race route. Yes, Team Sky must have had a little problem there. They have three riders at the tail of the bunch. Now... We hadn't heard from race radio. We can hear the referees out on course, and we didn't hear them call a flat tyre for anybody from Team Sky, but they were doing something back there. And they have a long way to get back to the front to join Team BMC, the US squad here. Team Green Edge, who are having a wonderful start to their first ever year as a professional team. The Australian, all-Australian professional squad. The not all-Australian riders on the squad, by the way and they've just won the circuit of the south not far away from here in france with luke derbridge in the week just gone so they're continuing a terrific start to the year incredible time trialist uh, luke derbridge it was his time trial ability that got him that victory in uh, the circuit of the south a lot of riders look to the circuit of the south as an indicator as to uh, the form that they're going to have going on to the, the next few big races and it's very often used as a as a curtain raiser for the ardennes classics which is what takes up here after the the specialists in the cobblestone classics start to take their first break for the season you may have noticed there that number 61 that was being worn by gregory rast of the radio shack nissan team now that would have been the number to have been worn today by Fabian Cancellara but he crashed last week and broke his collarbone, he's out and Gregory Rast last year finished fourth in this event uh, so it's quite an honour for him today to wear the team leader's number Well the group of 12 Phil have actually managed to stretch out a little bit of their advantage as we gaze out now at the Giants of Flanders, they've seen it all before. This time they're waving through the 12 leaders. The gap has moved out again. Just over three minutes, 93 kilometres to go. That's about 55 miles to race to the finish. 
Yeah, there's another section of cobblestones that are just waiting for these riders around the next corner, and that's going to be uh, section number 17 to go, the section of Avaluy de Wallers, 2.5 kilometres long, but look how fast the main field is starting to go. And look at the jerseys, the same coloured jerseys are all getting together. The teammates are starting to look after their men and starting to get them to the front end of the main field. Nice to see that miner's lamp, by the way. <laughs> Never forget, yes. the zigzagged underneath all of these cobblestone rows that we're looking at here there was a lot of underground coal mining done at the uh, in the early part of this century last yes, century the, the forest of Orenburg sits on top of a disused coal mine these days as we're heading on to sector 17 we're heading now to Waller this is a tough sector of cobblestones it's 2.5 kilometers in length which is just on one and three quarter miles for the riders to race on take a look at that chain and you might get some idea how these boys feel i reckon when they go to bed tonight the body continues to vibrate the worst thing actually phil about Paris roubaix is uh, yeah when you ride a race you're, you're expected to get uh, sore legs sore back but the day after Paris roubaix what actually hurts is the your fingers in between each joint of your fingers it's absolute agony because of the pounding your hands have been taking yeah. through over 31 miles of cobblestones and the big blisters that form just below on your fingers there yes some people say why on earth do they do it well it is a bike race they all don't like basically to ride it but they want to win it it means so much for them just a it's little bit of trouble again back in the bunch here now this time it's 227 Saramontins in the break rather not the bunch who we saw change a wheel earlier on he's now just hanging on at the back you might just have noticed the flags there. These riders, because Paris-Roubaix is such a complicated race, you're going left and right and east and west, north, all of the way, just to find your way around these cobblestones, you have to keep a very close eye on the flags because you notice now that as they come onto this uh, next part of the cobblestone section, they're picking up a tailwind which will push, uh, push the speed up even more. Look at that, it's swung round again. The, uh, the, that's the French flag, the Tricolore de France, uh, right over the heads of the riders as uh, the Omega Farmer Quickstep rider is doing all of the pacemaking, Guillaume van Kiersbulk. And what he's doing is indicating a particularly uh, gathering of the wind here now. It's getting stronger as the evening, as the afternoon draws on rather. But because they're always changing direction, it's no good telling you it's a headwind to Roubaix because in the next few minutes it'll be a tailwind. Getting very nervous now, the riders. They realise this is a long section of cobbles, and you might have noticed the pale blue jerseys of Omega Farmer Quickstep coming up to the front end of the peloton. And now the reason for that is, I think uh, Tom Bonin is going to make sure that he doesn't get caught out on this section, and that in fact is Tom Bonin sitting in second position. Yes, because they're now getting nervous. They're approaching shortly the forest of Arenberg here. It's the next section of cobblestones when we get there and that the big boys will want to be at the front to see the way up this long steady uphill climb through the forest dead straight as we head now towards Wallers itself there's one of the slag heaps over on the far side there's many of those dotted around here waste from the old mining industry which is why a lot of people came to the northern part of France in the old days a lot of Polish people came to settle here including uh, the famous Jean Stablanski who uh, was a world champion and he rode Paris-Roubaix as well and he always claimed, Phil, uh, he passed away a couple of years ago but he always claimed that his claim to fame was having worked in the coal mines below and raced over the cobblestones above. Yes, top and tail, Jean Slobenzi, quite a character, world champion uh, in the mid-60s at the expense of the great Irishman Shea Elliott. 2.43, the race for the cobblestones has been won so now they'll just block the road at the front so nobody can get up there that's why they want to be there first we're not at the cobblestones yet visibility is coming down now and don't adjust your pictures nothing to do with us it is the dust coming off the bikes and the cars well uh, you've got to take your hat off as well you see the the, the camera motorbike in front there these guys uh, from french television do a phenomenal job here of covering Paris Absolutely. Bay. and i would say they're pretty sore by the end of the day as well because they're also taking a fairly serious pounding Tête de la Course, now they're coming off uh, cobblestone section number 17. They've got that one under the belt. They've got five kilometres now to go to the Forest of Arenberg. So, as we look now, just uh, 90 kilometres left to race. The next section of cobblestones will be the tranche of Arenberg. The slice through the middle of the forest there. And these 12 riders have done nothing wrong at all today. They've been a really well-knit breakaway. This is the end of Sector 17 for the peloton. 
Well, you can Phil, see I... now the wind is basically behind them. <laughs> it's uh, zigzags all the time here. But, well, Phil, I know you're a great uh, lover of wildlife and wild animals. Well, once they get to the forest of Arenberg, if you can walk away from the race route, That's you lovely. will actually find a lot of wild boar still in that forest today. Well, they'll probably be well out of sight by the time the noise and the cacophony of Paddy Roubaix hits town. This is still at end of sector 17 for the leaders, uh, for the main peloton rather. The gap is hovering now, holding inside three minutes at 2.50. This is exactly going to plan now for the peloton. They're getting their favourites up towards the front. They're getting ready for the journey through Arenberg. A brief journey through some of the worst cobblestones of the day. Just in second wheel there is Gert Stegmans as well, a teammate, former teammate of Tom Bone, and now a teammate again of his. And also riding to the front, that first place rider for BMC in the red and black jersey, that Tor Hushoft. He had a terrible well, Tour of Flanders last week, but somehow, I don't know how he does it, Phil. He always manages to get himself back up for Tour of Paris-Roubaix. You've, you've always said he has a bad Tour of Flanders and a good Paris-Roubaix, and they're precisely eight days apart. Well, uh, Hushoft actually is on record recently as saying he wants to win this race. It's the one race before he retires he must win, and he clearly has that ambition today. Well, he does, and he's got a strong team. BMC Racing is one of the super squads on the international circuit. Uh, Alessandro Balan, former champion of the world and former winner of the Tour of Flanders. George Hincap with the experience. Last week, he attained a record that he took away from the famous Belgian rider Brick Scotter by finishing 17 times the race Tour of Flanders. That it, it just yeah. amazes me. George just never gets tired of this sport. He loves it. A little bit of a battle here at the back with the Liqui Gas boys trying to get themselves organised. That was uh, Juresh Sagan, number 148. He is the younger brother. Some say he will one day be better than Peter uh, Sagan, but Peter's not riding today, so it's up to him to show the flag for the family. This is the end of the cobblestone, sector 17 for the peloton. And as they come off the cobblestones, uh, with 55 miles left, the gap is 2.44. Sky got themselves on the front now, just keeping a steady tempo. They've got their big candidate in Juan Antonio Fletcher, the man they would like to see disappearing into the sunset later. And that's him over on the left-hand side. You can see that line of uh, Sky riders in the black and blue jerseys, uh, four of them in total. Position number four, of course, will be Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's a specialist at this race, extremely motivated. You've got to be a special character to get out of bed in the morning and think about this uh, bike race because it is something from uh, the olden days. It's archaic. And when they come to the forest of Arenberg, that is a Napoleonic road. 2.8 kilometres long. That's almost two miles. It's a beast. Just watching the tactics here unfold in front of us there are 25 teams in this race but we're watching just three or four always in control not surprisingly they're the ones that carry the big favorites team sky at the moment for one antonio fletcher we've had team bmc for uh, alessandro balan uh, always omega farmer lotto of course for tom bonan and by the way patrick lefevre who is the manager of uh, of uh, omega farmer quick step it's called now they uh, he has won this race in the last 17 years with one of his riders on 10 occasions. And today, if he gets his way, we'll be just running with tradition. He got the winner last week with Tom Bonin. He's relying heavily on Tom again today. Yeah, but the funny thing is, Phil, uh, although Tom Bonin was the winner last week of the Ronde van Vlaanderen to give it its uh, Flemish title, he, I think, is a much better suited rider to Paris-Roubaix. It's, it's mm. because of his body shape, because of the, the, the way he rides his bike, he's much more at ease on the flatter cobblestones than he is on the hilly cobblestones, which are the, uh, the ideal uh, situation and playground for the Tour of Flanders. Just when they come round that roundabout there, riders taking risks, jumping over that traffic furniture again. It's uh, a reflex reaction. We're looking down at the helicopter now as the peloton reforming again before we enter the forest of Arenberg. Two minutes and 40 seconds and again we've now got team BMC on the front. It's the American squad. George Hincapie is right on the sharp end in amongst those four riders with him. And it looks as though they're now trying desperately uh, to hold front position before we enter the forest. 
Now, you might have known they're pulling out all of the cars out of the gap. Now, that's an indicator. The race referees, Phil, believe that the gap will be starting to come down very quickly. They want to make sure the gap between the breakaway group and the main field is completely clean and sterile. There's and those... Uh, those uh, Mineshaft uh, mine shafts there, they are the, uh, the, the, nowadays it's in fact a mining museum, but that's the indication to all of the bike riders, any professional bike rider knows in the world, once you see that headgear in place, you're not far from Aremberg. Yeah, heading into hell, and uh, it's with a capital H, this stretch of road, known as the uh, hell of the northern France, as far as the queen of the classics is concerned. At least uh, Lady Luck has provided us with dry roads, although dusty roads can be most irritating to the eyes, as the breakaway, which has been away since around about 35 miles, 70 kilometres or slightly less than that since the start today. Here we are now, almost 85 kilometres from the finish, uh, just on 53 miles, and they're still clear by two and a half minutes as we head into the forest. As uh, those uh, minehead shafts there, they can't see them but we can from the helicopter they're going to get the best view of them very very shortly next stop will be the forest of Arenberg so looking down on the mining museum here uh, the headgear that many years ago used to take uh, miners down to uh, around about uh, one and a half kilometers below the surface of the uh, earth to uh, extract the coal which was uh, the firepower of the industrial revolution in the northern part of France here now these guys know on the horizon is that dreaded piece of cobblestones they will hit the cobblestone section here they come slightly downhill when they come into the forest of Arenberg and they will probably be touching around about 60 kilometers an hour that's 40 miles an hour downhill over cobblestones bang here we are straight on now as they hit the forest of Arlenberg now, the bones are rattling here. This is a long stretch, dead straight. Oh! And there's a rider down straight away. And that was Grisha Janotska who misjudged it totally. He's taken out a number of riders in the breakaway. That was a very nasty crash indeed. They've got to get those cars out. Now look at this, what happened, the front wheel, his front wheel started to go. He's trying to control it, gets the foot out, but there's nothing he can do and he goes down. I'll tell you one thing, Phil, when you go down on these cobbles, it seems to be much, much harder than if you go down on a tarmac road and then all of a sudden there's chaos in a minute we see the main oh. field start to charge in here there's the Omega Pharma Lotto rider Van Kielsburg he's up his bike is damaged but shortly you're going to see around about 120 guys charging down this ferry road as well well sadly that was a very heavy fall by Grisi Janortska and it took out also Guillaume Van uh, Kielsburg of Omega Pharma Lotto it's caused the problem for the breakaway they have now decimated themselves on the road it's a long steady drag as far as you can see before they get to good road well you can see they've buried off the right hand side so these riders have to ride on the cobblestones it's all been uh, dug up as well over on the left hand side so they've got to stay on the cobblestones they always say the best place to ride the forest of Arenberg Phil is actually in the middle right on the crown of the cobblestones that's where it's the smoothest but you know if you lose your front wheel as uh, that rider did from NetApp just a few moments ago there's not really very much you can do the organisation now they're trying to get all of their men to the front uh, the black and red those are the riders from BMC Race the American squad looking after Alessandro Berlan and George Hincapi. There's well, Berlan moving forward. Bonin sitting in the middle. No teammates around him right now. He is comfortable. Well, everybody wants to be first into the forest now. And the race has just been warned that the fallen rider, Grisha Janorski, is still lying in the road. And so they're going to have to be careful as they enter the cobblestones. It'll make it possibly even narrower. And so now the pressure on the front, the strong men of Paris-Roubaix will ride at 30, 33 miles an hour to stop anybody moving up. They are holding position for the forest and there is the entry. Phil, this is where the battle begins in Paris-Roubaix. It's all about the forest of Arenberg. I've always said this, I say it every year. You don't win Paris-Roubaix here, Phil, but you certainly have got a very good chance of losing it. Oming a farmer quick step in control. That must be Herd Stegemans in the first position. Second position is Tom Bonin. Well, they have managed to get rid of uh, the fallen Grishinovsky, which is safe for the riders. The breakaway, though, is now splintering all of the time, being driven on by Kenny De Hayes of Belgium in the breakaway, but they haven't recovered their composure from that fall. Now back to the peloton, well, as the peloton these... ride the centre of the road. You look at these bottles, Phil, dropping left and right, that's very dangerous indeed. You've got to make sure you keep away from those. 
Bert, it's Hurt Stegemans in first position. Bonin looking comfortable, looking for the smooth part of the road. I've got to take my hat off to him today, though, Phil, riding without any gloves. He is feeling the bike. He's feeling Pai Roubaix. He wants to get off this section of cobblestones. Still, for the moment, hardly. There's his teammate. His teammate's up and riding. That's yeah. why you have a man in the early morning breakaway while the chaos is at the back that of the pack. That was Guillaume pack. Van Kiesbeck who's just fallen back into the group now as another rider stops there with a back tyre punch. I also saw one Antonio Fletcher of Team Sky tucks right in behind Gert Stegemans. This is the chaos they're leaving behind on the road at the moment. And it looks to me as though we've got Radio Shack in trouble. Well, Omega Pharma quick step are still in control, but it's not the same pale blue jersey. It's the Bleu Blanc Rouge. And that, of course, is the French national champion, Sylvain Chavanel. He has become such an incredible one-day rider since he moved across from Team Coffee this a couple of years ago, Phil, to ride with this Belgian squad. And there's the flags of Belgium flying here, uh, more noticeable than the flags of France right now because it's, this is their terrain. You're right though, it is uh, Sylvain Chavanel, he's second place here and he's here to ride for Tom Bone. So we've got Gert Stegemans, we've got Sylvain Chavanel, we've got Juan Antonio Fletcher. Those are the riders at the head of the peloton. I just saw a stoppage there on the left-hand side of BMC Racing and I think it may well have been George Hincapi who was uh, getting assistance to get a spare wheel in. In the front end now, Sylvain Chavanel, followed by his teammate Tom Bonin. He is hammering down this road, they want to make the difference, they want to try and split this race apart here as Chavanel is followed by Bonin. They're in fourth position, you can just spot there Tor Husser, champion of the world a little bit further back except Van Mark the best ever finished by Chavanel in this event is eighth a couple of years ago uh, but he's not here to get a high finish he's here now to try and take his team captain Tom Bonin away from the rest riders caught in the middle I've just seen uh, Padato pass underneath our camera uh, but riders now battling for survival in the forest of Arnberg. Now you know why they rode so hard at the front and weren't concerned about the breakaway. They just wanted to make sure they were first into the forest. The breakaway will come back of its own accord. Well, look at the way the clock is tumbling. Now it's down to a minute and 55 seconds. It was two minutes, it was three minutes, it was four minutes. But look at the length of the main field. Sylvain Chavanel is doing a phenomenal job here this afternoon, not just for himself, but for the team. Omega Pharma, quick step, and that, of course, they're all today, Phil. They've got to be working for Tom Bonin. Chavanel has pulled this bunch into a long, long, thin line and at the back of it, it is going to be very tough for the riders to hang on as he heads up towards the top of the forest. There'll be a change of direction. There'll be good roads for a short while. Chavanel looks over his shoulder there, sees what sort of damage he's done and now they will steadily regroup. Pressure might come off just a little bit. A little bit now, Phil, because they've got themselves a six kilometres or four miles of smooth road. Time to get a breather. A welcome one at that too. There's Chavanel who did a great job in second place here. Looking further with the leaders now, it's Popovic pushing the pace. He survived the shunt at the back. No, this is in fact the second, this is the back group off the back of the group here, Paul. Yeah, this is the damage that has been done by the Forest of Arenberg. These are riders still trying to get themselves back into the race, but I'm saying pretty much to those guys, it's probably going to be an early shower here this afternoon. This is the group de Tets, as they say in French, the leading group on the race, and uh, obviously decimated by that nasty crash halfway through. So we just have seven riders left in the front now, eight in fact in this front group after that crash. Uh, the gap has come down to a minute and 46. We are exactly 50 miles from the finish in Roubaix. This rider coming through here. One of the uh, Europe car riders. In fact, this is a little group that's still off the back of the race here at a minute 44. They might well rejoin the front. This is David Boucher. There is uh, the net app rider, and I'm not sure if it's the one that was originally in the break. I don't think it is. It's another one of the team that's had bad luck. I tell you what, uh, you look when these riders go over the cobblestones, Phil, though, at a slightly slower speed than uh, Sylvain Chavanel, and you can feel and you can see the bikes are bouncing all over the place. Well, a forlorn uh, look on the face there of that net app rider left in the forest of Arnhemberg. May have had a broken chain or a flat tyre. Either way, nobody there to help him. Well, 
again as you can see once they get onto the smoothest section of road Phil they keep their energy levels topped up you've got to remember despite the excitement of Paris Bay because these riders they do get excited by this event it's a special event and if you're in the breakaway in Paris Bay you know that the pictures of your breakaway are getting beamed all over the world your family friends everybody's watching you and if you get caught up in the excitement and forget to eat later on in the race you pay for that you'll hit the wall you go into a glucose dis glucose debt these are the eight survivors of the battle of the forest the others have gone off the back now so they've lost four they're down to eight the gap is down to a minute 42 the field are reorganizing now they've regrouped again it is a very big peloton that's waving goodbye to the forest of Arenberg and heading into the last 50 miles of the day yep well it's, uh, now we're bear in mind Phil we've still got in the last 50 miles of racing 15 sections of cobblestones still to go there's another section in around about uh, four miles now and that will be a section at 1.4 kilometers in length and that's from uh, Milan Foss to Busigny well they seem to be well organized now the pressure's on Johan van Sommeren last year's winner is not too far off the front of this group either so again he's enjoying his day out in Paris-Roubaix a fifth and eighth and a win to his credit over years gone by it's not a very big group though the Forest of Arenberger once again has had her say on Paris-Roubaix anybody left behind now will have to find a whole lot of courage to ride themselves back into this race and again why it's important to have teammates Phil is because there are no team cars behind for the moment they're a long way back because of the Forest of Arenberg maybe two to three minutes behind so if you've got a flat tyre now you need a teammate up alongside you to swap wheels with Yes, and it won't get any easier now. This is a rider on uh, Team AG2 on La Mondiale who's trying to get clear as we go on now to the next sector of cobblestones. This is sector 16. This should be sector 15 now. As we hit sector 15 now at the Boussigny, we are on a three-star section of cobblestones, which means it's not as severe as the four or the five sectors, but it is still pretty hard, believe me. 1.4 kilometres is its length, just on one mile now. And this is the breakaway, the survivors of that breakaway, down to eight men. Well, eight men, uh, four of those riders feel pretty much uh, eliminated because of that nasty crash as they came into the forest of Arenberg but the gap has come down dramatically a minute and 41 seconds now and fortunately for these riders the wind seems to have uh, uh, obeyed a little bit but it's uh, amazing when we go back to the main field everybody now trying to see whether or not they can get away from this peloton a very reduced peloton because uh, once again of the damage that the forest of Arenberg reaps over this event these two riders trying to bridge the gap well uh they're probably about a minute and 35 behind the leaders just ahead of the main peloton just at the moment and uh, the man driving that breakaway again was the Latvian rider from Kofidis Alex Adamontins these riders here from uh, AG2R Jimmy Casper a very good sprinter on form too this is a good performance by Jimmy Casper he's a French sprinter and picks up uh, quite a few victories each year although he's not won the big races this would be far and away his greatest victory if he were to win this Oh, well, Jimmy Casper has been a professional for a long time Phil turned pro way back in 1998 as uh, we can see that there is a big gap because of that forest of Arenberg this is not a large group of riders as they come up to this next section of cobblestones because they too are now starting to line up for cobble section number 15 to go Milan Foss to Busigny well the vibration going but it looks as though Johan van Sommeren is far right of our picture there as he drops back though the rest of the race comes through it might be a team Skyrider actually who's on the front as they continue over the cobblestones now at a minute 40 the catch is not that far away this is Alex Saramotins of Latvia trying to split up the race because it's just how much strength you've got left now you've got to use it these are dire moments in Paris-Roubaix well I tell you what uh, team Vacon Soleil have really been an incredible team over the early part of this season and they managed to get themselves two riders into this leading breakaway Frederick Vokulin who rode exceptionally well in Paris in the early part of this season and Bert Jan Lindemann so they'll be quite happy happy to have two teammates in this group Jimmy Casper being brought back to the fold now as the peloton rip their way across to the Frenchman six victories last year for Jimmy Casper 
Alessandro Balan. Now, this is a very crafty little move here. You would have expected the move to come a little bit further back. Now, Alessandro Balan is a rider they dare not allow too much freedom. He was tipped before the start of this race as the number one man for Team BMC Racing, but there's no reaction in that group at all. Balan looking very, very comfortable as he passed through our camera there in the red colours of BMC as they continue on. Yeah, in fact, there's a slowing down in that main field. Now, that, I think, is uh, going to be a rather dangerous tactical move for anybody to allow Alessandro Balan an advantage when we start to get into this, uh, this repetitive nature of the cobblestone sections that are getting thrown at these riders. Balan is in that little group there, just forcing its way off the front of the pack. They're all hugging at the right of the road here. Balan is the fourth man in this line, and the first time we see a favourite lay down a card today, as they leave sector 15, Balan comes off it in fourth wheel. Now they look over and see what sort of a gap they've engineered over that main field. And they'll be happy to see that gap is there and Balan, I would think, will immediately start to participate in the pacemaking in that group because he'll realise that he'll have teammates behind who can cover the, the moves. Now, starting to take uh, interest in that group, there is Omega Pharma Quickstep looking for a little bit of assistance. So it's goodbye to sector 15 for the peloton. The gap remains at a minute and 40 seconds, but at the moment it's Alessandro Balan who's playing one of his cards. It could be a good move for Alessandro Balan as well, I'd have to say, Phil, because uh, you can see what's happening now. Uh, BMC Racing in the red and black jerseys, they're moving to the front and they will be discouraging the organisation. Minute 27, the clock readjusts uh, quite quickly there. 13 seconds has been pulled back. The peloton now beginning to sense uh, that the catch will be soon and then chaos will ensue because once they know there's nobody in front, everybody will be planning moves to try and escape. Yeah, it's a, not a very big main field, but one or two riders have recovered to pull themselves back in. Now, this is a seriously dangerous move because the man from Team Sky in the black and blue jersey is none other than yeah. Juan Antonio Fletcher. Two riders pushing the pace, two pre-race favourites, and Balan has taken it up now. He knows this is a good chance here to open a gap, and you'll find a big ally in the man in black because Fletcher is always up for a fight in Paris-Roubaix. Well, they're going to have to respond very quickly to this. The team that's been caught on the back foot, Phil, is Omega Pharma Quickstep because they should have seen a move like this. You don't let Balan and Juan Antonio Fletcher ride away from the main field in between the cobblestone sections. Well, this is a most interesting move, and it was all started by that little slipping away of Jimmy Casper. Sebastian Turgo of Europe Car has joined as well. Now you can see all of a sudden a bit of panic there on the uh, Omega Pharma Quickstep uh, squad because they realise, whoops, we've made a little bit of a tactical mistake here but we've got to put it to rights. Tete de la Course is the front end of the bike race. The chasers are at 1.27, the main field 15 seconds back. The gaps now, the four riders containing Balan also include one Antonio Fletcher. They are chasing now. Jimmy Casper's hung on in there along with Sebastian Turbo. They've got themselves 13 or 14 seconds over the peloton. Danger bells must be sounding in the peloton. Two big favourites have slipped away. Yeah, but all of a sudden, there you can see why you need to have a strong team. Uh, Tête de la Course, again, the front end of the bike race. Two riders in there from Vacon Soleil, that's Verkulen and Lindemann. But these eight riders... There's another crash at the left-hand side of the road, not a very dangerous one too, but these riders have been left at the side of the road. You see, the problem on a day Slip like this, Phil, is because it is so dusty, oh. and the dust makes it almost as slippery as if you're racing in the wet. Well, the rider in front slipped his gear and the rider who didn't touch him, I think, just lost concentration or applied his brakes and went down. Well, this is Heinrich Hausler, the Australian rider on uh, Garmin Barracuda. He tried to get himself across the gap, but he just couldn't quite make it. So Garmin now are also on the back foot. Well, the only answer now is to muster their troops and start to take up the chase here. 74 kilometres from the finish which is uh, just about uh, 46 miles to go to the end of the day but there's some terrible roads lying in front of these riders waiting for them waiting to catch them unawares these are the leading group of eight the survivors of the bunch of 12 which lost four men on the forest of Arenberg as they concentrate now just sitting here at the back is Benji Lindemann of Vacon Soleil Francais de Jure rather and Vacon Soleil for Lindemann 
Next section here, this is a uh, 14 to go. This is uh, Briant to Tilois les Marchiennes, a section of 1.1 kilometers. And if I can say, Phil, I know this section extremely well. This is almost like a, a motorway section of cobblestones compared to the Forest of Arenberg that they went over just a few moments ago. Well, sadly, the most notable rider who went from this break blocked in that crash in the forest was Yaroslav Popovic. Uh, so uh, Radio Shak Nissan has lost the man up front. They're going to have to try and replace him and bring up the cavalry from the rear right now. Riding steadily down the centre of the cobblestones. It sounds strange, but it's often the best place to be on these roads. And pedalling as fast as you can to get rid of them quickly. 57 seconds is the gap now. Inside a minute and closing fast is this group here, which contains Alessandro Bolan, Juan Antonio Fletcher, as we bounce on to sector 14. Perth, this is from uh, Briand to Tilwali Marchin. Now, this is a very clever move by Team BMC Racing. They've seen this as a great opportunity, and having an ally like Juan Antonio Fletcher in the group, all of a sudden the cat is going to be put amongst the pigeons in the main field. And look at the, f the flags there on the right hand side, the flags of the Lion of Flanders. Well, they've got to wait for about uh, 25 seconds before the new Lion of Flanders, Tom Bonin, appears, and there is his group. Well, we go around these very exposed fields, constantly changing directions, like a giant snake lying across the department of the Nord Pas de Calais. And not surprisingly, it is Tom Bonin's team who are driving the chase here. The warning flags are up now because they know two men that really could affect the outcome of this race have got themselves a little advantage. And it's not surprising that Bowen has now said to his team, we've got to counter this move now. Well, they're going so fast, Omega Pharma quick step, that they're in fact opening up a gap over the front end of the peloton. Second position, the Bleu Blanc Rouge, red, white and blue, is Sylvain Chavanel. He really has become a great specialist. You know, it's 15 years, Phil, since a Frenchman won Paris-Roubaix, and I wonder if Sylvain Chavanel is going to come up with the goods this afternoon. That's uh, Stuart O'Grady going through there. Right in front, right behind him is Tomica himself, the pale blue jersey of Omega Pharma Quickstep. Stuart O'Grady, the winner of this great race and the only Australian to indeed have ever won this race. In back in 2007, leading the three-time winner, Tom Bonin, who's looking to equal the record of four today as the split is still there this is real pressure just now well Bonin saw that the rider in front of him was starting to weaken and losing the gap and he took the responsibility of closing down that gap himself straight onto the train which is being led by his teammates it's an incredible thing to think that you could have won this race three times there are a few riders who have done it in the past in fact in all there are six riders who've won this race three times including Dee Vlamink who's won it four Second wheel now, it's Sylvain Chavanel, the champion of France, but very much on the Belgian team uh, of Tom Bonin, and is there to help him with his enormous strength. He's in second place now. They are driving off this sector of cobblestones. 52 seconds the spread across yeah. the whole field in Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, but Phil, there's not very much respite here this afternoon for these bike riders, because in two kilometres, it's the next section of cobblestones. So, as Gert Stegmans lifts the pace now, these are desperate moments in Paris-Roubaix, but the gap remains of 52 seconds. Number 33 there, George Hincapi tried to get himself onto the back of the group. He obviously had a little bit of a mechanical problem. Hincapi a finisher 17 times of the Ronde van Vlaanderen, the Tour of Flanders. And I've got my fingers crossed that he gets through the early part of this season nice and safely, because if he does, he should be starting the Tour de France for the 17th time in his career. It's remarkable. Well, this is the return of George Hincapi into the main peloton. He was delayed in the Forest of Arnhemberg. And as we see the rider here with the patches on his elbow, that's Andre Greipel. So he must have gone down as well. He had a flat tyre in the Orenberg. He also fell with that. He's been patched up and he's just rejoined the group. So Hincapi is back now as we head on to Sector 14. So Sector 14, a long section of cobblestones here as well, Phil. 2.4 kilometres in length. We are entering now sector 14, the gap is down from 52 to 47 seconds. George Hincapi has rejoined at the back of this group after his problems in the forest, so too Andre Greipel. 
uh, but they're more concerned about the whereabouts of that group of six riders, which includes Alessandro Balan and Juan Antonio Fletcher. But Paul, the spread now is only 46 seconds. It's not very much at all, and uh, I was pretty right there, Phil, when I spotted one of the BMC riders stopping in the forest of Arenberg, and I thought it was George Hincapie, and he's battled his way back into this race. This is Team Rabobank, the rider in the breakaway. As he continues now, Juan Antonio Fletcher, the rider in black for the British Team Sky, dodging around there, but he, he loves this, these one-day classics and he always rides well here. He's gone early and it might have been an impetus just because he saw Balan go, he thought, why not? He's played an interesting card, it's a very different race now. Clouds are still heavy, but I don't think the rain is going to come. Well, uh, fingers crossed for the riders, but uh, it is extremely windy out there. Omega Pharma Quickstep have seen this now as being a very dangerous move. You don't give an advantage to riders like Balan and Juan Antonio Fletcher, but you can see the damage. You can see the gaps now starting to appear in the, uh, in the main field as the pressure really is starting to get put down. So as the riders continue on here, we've just seen the finish, by the way, of the under 23 Paris-Roubaix for uh, junior riders and it's been won by a Danish rider who's finished on his own uh, Mads Schmidt uh, so well done to him and Jonathan Dibben a British rider has gone over there in third place but 69 this... kilometres Paul look at the way they're bounced it's a nasty corner usually he's covered in mud well I tell you what you just watch the way these riders go around and these guys are they're going around these corners as if in fact they were uh, they were going round a normal road the riders in this group are the, the Rabobank rider by the way is uh, Martin Wainant and he's the rider in the orange jersey but the main field are right on their coattails here this afternoon the gaps are appearing the pressure is coming on and we've still got 70 kilometres to go before the finish the gaps down to 37 Seven seconds between the eight leaders and the six chasers and the main field well they're only 12 seconds further back and the French rider who's made it Mathieu Danu is also and there's another rider stopped by the wheel in the air looking around for help let's hope he gets it quickly because your race can be over in the blink of a cobblestone today 37 seconds now as the breakaway is being chased down by those six riders up front and the peloton under immense pressure now because it's all down to Tom Boner's team to do the chasing here. I've not seen any of the lime green jerseys of Farnese Wines because that's the team of Pazzato, but I think they've been under pressure the whole day at the wrong end of the field. Well, this is a very long section of cobblestones, Phil, because in fact it's two cobblestone sections bolted together to make section 14 to go. It's uh, Tilwali Marchen right the way through to Sarzé Rosier, and it's a total distance of 3.5 kilometres. But we are really now starting to put the hammer down and in fact I think that's a set that's in fact the corner that was the end of Frank Schleck's uh, Paris Tour de France last year when we went round going in the opposite direction when he broke his collarbone two years ago indeed. sorry well two years ago and his own brother Andy just drove past him took a long hard look at him and felt pretty sad 32 seconds the gap now as we're looking here at Martin Venons a drive on at the breakaway group which is Alessandro Balan oh there they are for you anyway Le Dianu is the rider from France yeah he's got himself into that group around that corner oh this is a bit nasty watch out for that little bit of traffic furniture in the middle of the road there this is uh, the, the end of that long section they've got a nice long piece of smooth road now Phil as they come up to here because they're heading up to the town of Orshi Ooh. and that section of cobblestones at Orshi after that they go throughout down a little nasty road called the road of the cemetery 22 seconds now is the gap to the chase group of six riders including Balan and Fletcher so the situation at the moment eight leaders six riders chasing at 22 seconds and the peloton are just behind Sylvain Chavanel, what a rider from France, a bleu blanc rouge, a red, white and blue and I tell you where you don't want to be in a situation like this Phil is at the back of that line, the wind is obviously coming from the riders uh, left hand side here and you can see they're keeping themselves right in the gutter as they close down on that six man group which was halfway across the gap and it was all done by the work of Omega Farmer Lotto but in fact they've caused a bit of a split and on the back of that group the tall lanky figure there is uh, the Garmin Barracuda rider the winner from last year Johan van Sommeren 
I don't know what it is about this race, but Johan van Sommeren simply loves it and he only likes to be in front of our camera. It has been that way for many years, but when he got clear on his own towards the end last year, that really was the best performance of his life to finish alone in Roubaix and win the day. And all the time he's being hurt by these cobblestones, he'll keep saying to himself, but I'm the defending champion. I am last year's winner and he won't drop away. Nice shot there of Stuart O'Grady. Stuart O'Grady, former winner of this race. So what an incredible career Stuart O'Grady has had. And he still comes back to ride these races. These now are the survivors of that early morning breakaway. Yet coming back down, Phil, to the, the normal recipe that we expect from a Paris-Roubaix. The early morning breakaway gets clear. It builds up an advantage of four or five minutes. But when the big guns start to fire in the main field, they pull it all back together. So within the kilometre, as we go through a feeding zone here, snatch it if you can. A uh, little food vital for the last 66 kilometres of racing. A Beauvais la forêt is the town which we have for the feeding stop here. It's not a stop at all, of course. You snatch it on the run. The coming together of the field, just inside 67 kilometres to go. You just might have noticed there uh, Tom Bonin uh, sitting up and moving his finger around. That was to try and get the guys to get themselves organised to try and take advantage of that split they'd got in the peloton. Now's the time to make sure, get those pockets filled up with food, get those pockets filled up with drink, because it's going to be eyes down for the running now towards the finish, because as we start to get towards the outskirts of Orshi, these cobblestone sections are going to hit the riders every four or five kilometres. Well, those riders up front who've just got caught will be very tired now. They led the race for just about 85 miles today after breaking away fairly early on. They're caught with a 67 kilometres to go, which is about 40 five miles now left to race to the finish and Sylvain Chavanel is just a cheeky little move this just t testing the water I would suggest to see who's coming out to play and they're all after him well it's a good move because when everybody's taking on board their drinks and they slow down they're making sure that they've got their bottles into their bags and and all of a sudden if somebody sneaks off the front like this it's done at a time when people may well just be looking the other way and if they give an advantage to a guy like Sylvain Chavanel well they might never see him again he's a very good individual time trial look at that split in fact it has created a split going through the feeding station that was all because of the pressure of Tom Bonin now that might be a little move Tom Bonin is on the same team as Sylvain Chavanel he's told everybody to settle down while his teammates is attacked it's a nice tactic, see who's joining him. Got three riders and three riders coming over. Well, former time trial champion of France, he's currently the road race champion of France, so Sylvain Chavanel. Many, many years ago, Phil, like a lot of the French riders, they, they didn't like this bike race. There is Pippo Pozzato, he's the man that you've been looking for, number 41 in that lime green jersey, sitting at the back end of the main field. Just in front of him is Alessandro Balan, he's number 31 in the black and red jersey of Team BMC Racing. Yep. But this group now, I think, is on the defensive. Time to reassess the situation, see who they've lost, see who's still here, who's dangerous. We know that uh, four big favourites are here, Pizzato, Balan, Fletcher and Bonin. They're there. This is a counter move now by a rider who could win this race, let's face it, in Sylvain Chavanel on the left. He was very strong last week in the Tour of Flanders and of course if you give him that little bit of an advantage, well we could see something rather special happening here this afternoon. Uh, 15 years since a Frenchman has won Paris-Roubaix and that's maybe what Sylvain Chavanel's thinking about. Yes, the Belgians have the outright monopoly on this race by the way. Over the year they've won 55 of these races and France has won 30 so that's 85 of the additions they've shared out between them meaning they've only lost 25 of them so yeah. now a different tete de la course ahead of the bike race here this afternoon getting themselves organized at 65 km kilometers to go this is the section of cobblestones at 13 to go at a beuvry la forêt all the way down into orchi looking down now on sector 13 here of the 27 sectors there's still plenty of bad road ahead the breakaway has been wiped out at around uh, 45 miles from the finish and this new group a uh, new attack off the front just off the trunk of the front of the peloton was spearheaded by Sylvain Chavanel and look at the damage done to the peloton it is totally broken up the peloton it is uh, smashed the peloton into smithereens here this afternoon again a long section of cobblestones are 1.4 kilometers long this section only rated as a two-star rating the next section though phil is going to be absolute chaos because that is the section which takes the riders away from the town of orshi 
And if you ever drive or ride your bike around in this area, it's an amazing smell because there's a chicory roasting factory and it smells like coffee for miles and miles <laughs> around. The ride at the back there in that blue jersey for Saxo Bank was Mikhail Morkov. He was in that breakaway. Now he's hanging on in what's left of the peloton there, which is now again under pressure here. These cobble sections now come so quickly that you've really got to go with the front moves. And if you can't, the gaps just pull open very, very quickly indeed. The peloton are desperate now, diving for any little bit of road they can find that might help. Forming a line on the right. This is an attack by Sebastian Turgo, who was in that leading group of six, now trying to go it alone. Well, I suppose you could say Turgo is looking for his turbo here this afternoon <laughs> over the cobblestones, but Sylvain Chabanel is the man who's got the big V8 engine whistling here this afternoon. He is a man on fire for France. The French will be going absolutely ballistic if they've got any possibility of a man from their country winning this great classic. I have to say that Chavanel is what we call a real bike racer. He just gets out there and pedals to the maximum ability he has. He has caused absolute chaos behind him. He must know uh, what he is doing in the desperate moments to try and regroup this field because he has uh, snatched the bottle there nicely as he comes off that sector. Four seconds is the gap. Uh, but that's uh, to the peloton, he's looked over to see the damage, he knows now, he'll assess which riders have joined him. Well, I tell you what, uh, let's not forget that Sylvain Chavanel, just before the Tour of Flanders, was the winner of the uh, three days of La Panne, and that was because of his incredible domination in the individual time trial there. That was the, the third stage in the afternoon, and uh, because of that, Sylvain Chavanel walked away with the, the victory in the Driesdag van der Panne, as they say in Flemish. Turbo being joined by the remnants of that breakaway. Chavanel getting up, always conscious, always checking out who is behind them at the moment. But the gap is opening. Well, the gap is opening, and uh, as you can see, there's quite a, there's two riders trying to get across the gap as they come into Orshi. Just on the 40 miles from the finish now, it's time for everybody to sit up and have some food before the final showdown begins. These boys are just pushing themselves them. If we have enough problems now with the cobblestones, we've even got speed humps here in France to slow the traffic down on a normal day. But Easter Sunday is not a normal day today here in France. Well, these are the two chasers coming across here, uh, wearing number 21 for Team Rabobank, Martin uh, Jelingi. He's a, a great bike rider. And Edwig... Uh, Camera to, camera to Belgium is the rider setting the pace there for Team Cofferdies. Well, he's a rider who had a little bit of a mechanical problem earlier on because you might have noticed uh, he didn't have a number on his bike and uh, lots of riders will have lots of stories to tell at the end of Paris-Roubaix but it would appear now that Team Sky Pro Cycling are actually on the back foot too. They've decided it's important for them to try and pull this bike race back together again. Well, we've got Chavanel in that group now. He's been joined there by Turgo because Turgo's fallen back. Laurent Mangel is up there as well. Uh, Mikel Shaw, the Swiss rider on Team BMC, is the tall man just uh, shadowed by Chavanel at the moment in the red and black. And the other rider who has got into this group is uh, Mathieu Le Danu. And uh, there's all the names for you confirmed now. The Danu has come pretty strong in this last 10 kilometres, the Frenchman. He certainly has. Uh, I think uh, Team BMC Racing won't be too happy, Phil, with the position of uh, Mik Mikhail Shah. They would have much preferred to have one of their other team stars in the breakaway like this, Torhushov, Taylor Finney, or even George Hincapie. But this race can all come back together very, very quickly, especially once they leave this town now of Orchy. Because after Orchy, they've got the Sector Pavé de Orchy, which is 12 sectors to go. And that's 1.7 kilometres long, but it's bolted together with another the nasty section at 2.7 kilometers and very often you'll see the group split on this section of cobblestones and now into the town of Oshi and when you leave this town it is a bumpy way out for sure narrow twisting and dangerous and again the peloton applying the pressure at the front because nobody wants to relinquish the front positions now as they head towards the narrow entry into the cobbles Around these corners, uh, uh, most of these riders, they've actually ridden uh, during the last week, they've ridden the last uh, 50 or 60 kilometres, so they're getting now, there's a crash somewhere down there. It... 
where we're oh. hearing Tor Hushoff has crashed. We might see a picture of him there. That is a playback of it. That is Hushoff falling on that left turn and landing quite heavily on his left side there. Ouch. Again, Phil, it's amazing, really. It's because this is a dry Paris-Roubaix that the surface of the road is very, very slippery because of the dust. Hushoff ripped his shorts up there. He has to try and get himself back into this race. Look at him. His uh, shoes came undone there. As he went round that corner, it was just that the wheels went from underneath him and he went down very hard indeed what is happening is the tires have now gathered a film of dust on them from these journeys over the cobblestones and if they're over leaning the bike on these corners they're losing all traction and going down well Jalingi here in the orange jersey of Rabobank they're about to get pulled back into the fold by what remains of the peloton under the uh, under the pressure of team sky pro cycling all over the front end of this main field this afternoon you've got the black and red jerseys of BMC racing George Hincapie never very far away from the front he's managed to get himself back into this race despite having a very bit of bad luck when he went through the forest of Arenberg now, interestingly, those lime green jerseys are the teammates of Filippo Pazzato. And Pazzato is now much more better placed than he has been the whole race, as he knows that the journey through Orshi is possibly another vital point of this race. The peloton forms the arrowhead now, and the cobblestones are literally just around this corner. Well, I know exactly where we are now, Phil, because as again, once again, you see uh, this young rider from Europe car trying to take advantage. It's still Turgo, but once you get to the end of this road, you turn left, and then all of a sudden, it's the forest. It's the uh, the cobble. Oh, we went round there very <laughs> sharp. I think that was a camera angle, but it you didn't could. look very good to me. I thought Sebastian Turgo there was about to come into our living rooms as he gets onto the cobbles here. They only give this, and I'm always surprised, a three-star rating. Not by far the most severe, but it is it is a very difficult section there's no cars as you can see are allowed down this road all the public if they want to come have to walk from the village well this is a I've always thought this is a very difficult section of cobblestones Phil because you've got this section here which is 1.7 kilometers long or a mile if you like in old currency and it's bolted together with the next section which is straight after it at 2.7 kilometers long and that's 1.8 miles that is the view of the northern part of France that is a view which just brings back to me the memories of Paris-Roubaix, La Reine des Classiques, the Queen of the Classics. And this is the view from the cobblestones as they fight back over all of the wheels which are pounding them into the ground right now. We have seen Turgo take his chance here and leave the other five riders if he can. Uh, they're about to get swept up anyway. This is a terrific move by the Europe car rider as he pushes on here. He won't be a marked rider, he is a good cyclist, but he's not a man we would talk about as a winner of this race yet. Not yet, but uh, who knows what can happen in a dry Paris-Roubaix. You take your chance and you never know what happens behind. If there's a crash and there's a bit of confusion, all of a sudden you've got yourself a 15 or 20 second advantage. And then if people have to wait, he's off the first part of this cobblestone. And now he's going down the road, which they call the Le Chemin de Le Cemetière, which is bolted together with the Chemin of the Abattoir. So once you come out of the Abattoir, <laughs> it's straight into the cemetery. As the field now try to regroup. Now, Sebastian Turgo, he's only ever won a ra three races in his life. And in three days' time, he'll be celebrating his 28th birthday. What a result that would be for him, a little advance of his birthday today. As you can see, the giants of Flanders. This time, it's a giant pig of Flanders <laughs> that's managed to come up. When I say the Flanders, these are the Flandre Artois, the French Flanders. Now, Domica comes to the front. Look at this now. Look at the pressure this man with pistons for legs as he oh. just pounds those pedals now. And he's got trouble on his back wheel too. I'm very sorry to announce that Sylvain Chavanel has just had a flat tyre at the back end of this group. It came crackling over race radio. Now, Domica knows this is the place to make a move. And look who is locked onto his back wheel in the lime green none other than Pippo Pozzato the two of them come off those cobblestones Pozzato takes a look at Tom Bonin this is Turgo that terrific piece of turn of speed by Bonin has brought two more favourites into the front now they bubbled up to the top and they've caught Sebastian Turgo and again it's now the reverse now it's Fletcher and Balan who's got and that could be Balan coming across coming across you can see one of the big riders from uh, BMC looking over to see what sort of damage is being done here but look at the position of Bonin he is a powerhouse the other style there though if you look at people Pozzato in the lime green jersey there 
there, Phil. He looks so smooth on his machine. He's just tickling those pedals to keep the speed up to 50 kilometers an hour as Tom Bonin looks over his shoulder to say, right, I think this is the move. It's an awful long way to go to the finish, 57 kilometers, but if you get the gap, go for it. This is the sort of race where you take a chance when opportunity presents itself and he had to take his move. Now he took a second take there at the BMC rider coming up and it is Balan who's joined at the back of the group. So another favourite has come up, three out of four up front now. Yeah, but look at the main, well, it's not the main field anymore, is it? Because it's been smashed to smithereens, splintering off the front. Riders one by one trying to form this winning breakaway if they can. Well, I must say that this race is only for the strong willed. We now have four riders in front, 57 kilometers to go, and there, sadly, is the puncture to Sylvain Chavanel. Well, that is really bad luck for Sylvain Chavanel, and I said if you have a flat tire at the wrong time in a bike race like this, you can wait for a long time. It's almost two minutes, Phil, since I heard the race radio announce that he'd had that flat tire, yeah. so he's got to do an awful lot to try and get himself back into Paris-Roubaix this afternoon. From a possible winner of the race, he's now one of the also-rans. It is every man for himself now. Balan has got up here, Bone has got a teammate joined him in that light uh, sky blue colours. So he's got an ally, five very strong men. Turgo has found the strength to hang on to the back end of the whip. Uh, but just take a look over the shoulders of these boys. The field is coming back. What's left of it? Yep, exactly what is left of it. Well, they're going to have to try and pull these riders back now, Phil, because in about uh, one and a half kilometres time, another mile of racing, they come up to section number 11 to go. The pressure is now on at 56 kilometres to go, which is about 54 miles from, uh, 34 miles from the finish. And uh, Alessandro Balan has joined up here, but Tom Bonan is just riding like a tornado. They call him Tornado Tom. I thought you'd forgotten about that, but earlier on today I saw a big sign at the side of the road for which said, Come back, Tornado Tom. Well, I think he's back. Now, this is the way to Whoa. ride a race. This is the way to be a great champion. I've always said that Paris Roubaix is a better suited race to Tom Bonan than the climbs of Flanders. Even though he loves that race, he's a Flemish bike rider, he wants to ride well in Flanders, but his size and his weight, I think, go against him when it comes to those short, sharp little climbs. Here, he can get the turbo whistling. Tornado Tom has got that V8 all of the turbos whistling now and he's thinking about a big ride a big escapade on the run down towards the finish and I'll tell you what the Dutchman who's joined him on the same team Nicky Terpstra he's having a terrific start to the season this year he finished fourth uh, a couple of weeks ago in the uh, three days of Dapana which is about a week long these days and he's won one race but he's showing the sort of form we haven't seen from him for a long time he came to this team last year after the Milram team disbanded which was a German squad uh -oh. he's a really strong man these boys are making a mistake here Phil they've got to get themselves organised very very quickly you Absolutely. don't let Tom Bonin ride away especially when he's got his teammate up alongside him because Nicky Terpstra was formerly the national road racing champion of Holland and he's a very good individual time trialist you put the two together ouch Yes, and let's not forget, Patrick Lefebvre, the manager of Tom Bonin's team, is looking for his 11th win uh, this year in Paris-Roubaix. Bonin's already delivered three for him. Is he going to make it four? Number 11, that's Tom Bonin. The flashes on the cuffs of his racing jersey, indicating he's a past world road race champion. This, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Nick, uh, Nicky Terps, who we're looking at here, Phil, he was six in the Tour of Flanders last week as well, behind his teammates. Form. He is in Absolutely incredible riding form. riding well. This is a, such a dangerous move. Uh, don't the peloton realise they could be letting Paddy Roubaix race off into the sunset? Well, going away so far from the finisher is very reminiscent of a certain Fabien Cancellara, Johan Museo. These are guys who've taken the risks of a long, long breakaway, not waiting to the final few sections of cobblestones, Boonen wants to do something very dramatic here this afternoon. Talk about throwing the gauntlet down. I think he's thrown both down this afternoon. Well, the thing is, this race has been full on since we entered the forest of Arenberg. Everybody is giving their all. There's nobody hiding, planning a move later. They're all 100% committed now. And Bonin has sensed this, and he thinks, well, if you're all doing the best you can, I think I'm better than you guys, and he's going to try a move. And he is stronger when it comes to the cobblestone section, but the big advantage he has, Phil, is having a teammate alongside him in a move like this. Yep. Cancellara made a move like 
outside. They're sort of around about the same distance to go, but he rode the whole of the race on his own. But having an ally from the same team alongside with you makes this a much more dangerous move than a move by Fabian Cancellara a couple of years ago. On to the next sector of cobbles. Number 11 we go, Oshi Les Oshi. This is a four star and it's just on two and a half kilometers or about two miles long. Look at the way Bonin rides. That's a long one. Look at the way Bonin rides, uh, Phil, on these cobblestones. He sits right up and he's comfortable. He keeps the power going over, looks for the middle, the crown of the cobblestones while the main field are losing time. It's almost 20 seconds, the difference between the two leaders. And now Team Sky have decided to take the responsibility of they putting the to. pressure on. They have to because with that, there's nobody left to chase now. What's happened to their strength here? Because three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, sixteen riders in this chase group, the Peru Bay, with still about 32 miles to ride, is down to a selection of about 35 men. Scuttling up in the uh, blue and black. Oh well, Bonin is too strong for his own teammate here. Now I'm not sure this is a great move because Nicky Terpstra he just cannot ride the cobbles like Bonin, so he's going to have to sit up and wait. It's going to be a long, long, lonely effort now for Tom Bonin. But if he's got the form that we believe he's got in those legs of his this afternoon afternoon Phil this could be some monumental ride well, by Tomake if Tom Bonham wins this race from this far out on his own he will go down as one of the best winners in the history of Paris-Roubaix he's also looking for his fourth record equaling win he is riding like a man possessed here look at him hitting the pedals Phil you know he doesn't need to do this he doesn't need to jump away from a group because he's got one of the fastest finishing sprints in the group behind but he wants to do it with panache he wants to do it with style but now the responsibility is right on his shoulders it's up to them to try and catch him stupidest thing to do or the most ingenious and we won't know the answer for that for about uh, an hour and ten minutes <laughs> Yep, it's going to be uh, a good hour and ten minutes before we get to the finishing uh, velodrome here, but they're, uh, they're scrambling there. That's Juan Antonio Fletcher uh, with his teammates on the front end of the main field, Sky Pro Cycling Squad from the United Kingdom. Two riders in there from BMC Racing uh, trying to stay in contact. The one uh, riding the cobbles crown there is Alessandro Balan. He was on the wheel of Bonin when Bonin put the acceleration in with Nicky Terpstra and pop, he went straight off the back of it. Bonin is on his own. The favourites are in a group of 16 behind him and the clock is ticking upwards. 27 seconds at the moment. Tom has just tamed these cobblestones once again. They bite everybody else, but he seems to have the word with them. Terpstra looking for a little bit of smooth road. Please let me have a bit of respite from this hammering from the cobblestones. He was an integral part, and if he could have just stayed with Bonin, what a dynamic duo that was going to provide this afternoon. But Terpstra, he couldn't stay on the wheel of no. Bonin. Bonin is, for me, Phil, one of the greatest specialists in the peloton these days over these cobbles. There is the unlucky uh, Chavanel there in the blue top to his Tricolore Champions jersey of France. He's coming back slowly through the group. I'm not exactly sure where he's placed, but we think he lost quite a bit of time. Tony Gallopan of Radio Shack is just behind him. He also had a flat tyre. There he is, just peeping into our picture. But I think they're still quite a way off the pace. Yeah, but Chavanel won't give up. He knows you don't give up in a race like Paris-Roubaix. Yes, everyone will have bad luck at the, sometime throughout the, the course. And you've got to fight back. You've got to have it in your gut that you want to get through Paris-Roubaix. Number 61 there, yes, Gregory, Gregory Rast, Rast from Team Radio Shack Nissan Trek. He was fourth in this race last year, but I think he's also been claimed a puncture victim as well. So three strong riders that they may close down if the group eases up, but there are 16 boys trying to get together to bring back this one man, Tom Bonin. 29 seconds as he nudges up again, and he comes into the last 50 kilometers of the day, just over 31 miles to hold on to the advantage. Phil, he would only make a move like this if he felt that he was in some special kind of form and special kind of condition here this afternoon. He's riding to the left-hand side of the road there. It's slightly smoother. Take it easy around that corner, Tomica, because it's very slippery indeed in these dry conditions and the sand. And this is Nicky Terpster going slowly backwards. The difference... Oh, and Pazzotto's crashed. Yeah, Pazzotto's gone down. He's in collision there. And he looks at the ride he collided with was Marco Macato, another Italian. There's the, in no. fact, it's Pazzotto's fault. And that was the corner there. It's just, just the little dusty conditions. He went down very hard indeed. In fact, it was Stein de Volde, the rider who went down uh, just behind him. So, Pozzato, when Lady Luck is not smiling on you, she can be a beast. 
Well, that looks as though that's rather hurt him there. He's taking a little bit of a while to get back into it. The Italians don't like this race, as you probably have gathered by now. Uh, this isn't their sort of race, although they do have a race in Italy now called the, the White Road, the Strada Bianca, the Bianca Strada, and that is a very good race, similar to Pairo Bay in many ways. 30 seconds. There's, as we're looking at Nicky Terpstra here as he gets uh, brought back to the fold. He's back into his element when he's on good road, but he just can't ride those cobblestones at the same speed as his teammate Bonin. Well, I'm not sure how many people can ride the cobblestones with the same speed as Tom Bonin now. The team that really have got to put themselves together is Team Sky Pro Cycling. They've got three riders in this group. The most important, of course, is Juan Antonio Fletcher. He'll be sitting in third position, but they're all going to have to work together if they want... Team Sky, Phil, have got four riders in this group, actually. They're in a strong tactical position. They've just got one problem. They've got to chase down Tom Bonin. And it might be a big problem, this. We're looking back here at the champion of France, as Sylvain Chavanel. Looks as though... Uh, oh, he's in amongst the cars now, which is a good sign and a bad sign. It means he can't go quite as quick as he might want to. Uh, but he is going to pick his way back to uh, quite a few dropped riders here. But he's still a long way to get through to that group of 16. Well, this is the man who's spearheading the race for Roubaix now. Well, they've put the yellow neutral service vehicle uh, right in behind Tom Bone and his team car won't be allowed to come up until the race referees have given a, a race indication of a one minute gap and then all of a sudden you'll see the quick step team car scuttling across the gap to give, keep Tom Bone informed of how the race is unfolding. He's getting himself uh, as light as possible here, just throwing that energy bar away. I don't want to carry any more weight. 34 seconds is the gap it's ever so slow but he's prizing it open as we go inside that 31 miles 49.5 kilometers team sky have realized the danger they're doing all they can for one antonio fletcher but they're still losing ground well what's going to happen now phil this is the town of mont saint pevel and there's an awful section of cobblestones here it's a five-star section the cobblestones of mont saint pevel three kilometers long and I would say Tom Bonin is around about 200 meters away from it but remember the cobblestones uh, they're always uh, claiming victims uh, flat tires mechanical problems they if there's something on your bike that can fall off it often does fall off on the cobblestones of northern France on this day we don't wish Tom any bad luck at all I'm just saying that because it doesn't mean he's got this race in the bag yet by any manner or means but He's taken the race by the horns here this afternoon. He knows very shortly he'll take a, a left-hand turn off this road and then right in front of him, three kilometres of cobblestones at Mont saint -Pavel. This is a fabulous show of strength and such a, when you're the outstanding favourite as Tom Bonham was before the start and you make an attack like this on your own with such a long way to go, then you are a real champion. Well taken, Mr. Bonin there, the team, uh, team alongside him there, giving him a bottle. He, you know, it's amazing that he wants to win Paris-Roubaix like this, Phil, because, you know, he could sit in the main field, come to the finish line with a group of six or seven riders, and with his sprint, he could walk away. But he wants to show panache. He wants to do something special. So we're looking down on the chase group here now, and they're all under the escort of three riders, four riders from Team Sky to try and get one Antonio Fletcher back up to this man. Antonio Fletcher has finished second and third, but he's never won, and Tom Bonin has stopped him before and may be doing it again. Five-star rating here for the cobblestones of mont en pavel three kilometres long, 1.8 miles long, this almost two miles of racing. This is where Bonin excels. Do you remember, Phil, when he was just a 21-year-old bike rider? He came to Paris-Roubaix and the same team as George Hincapie to help Hincapie try and win this bike race, and all of a sudden, he was the man who came up with the goods and finished in second place ahead of his team leader. Yes, and uh, that was the start, and in fact, uh, next year, uh, Tom had left the team and was the leader of his own team. Now, the chase behind also includes uh, Boyson Hagen on the Sky team. That is their second uh, man that they've lined up. Here's the sorry sight of Filippo Pazzato in the orange fading away. And he looks uh, zooming through there with Sylvain Chavanel, but it's the end for Bazzato. I think this is it. Well, when you see that car there, Assistance Medical, that tells you exactly what's going wrong. He's obviously banged himself up quite nastily. Doctor got the, uh, the magic ice spray there on his knee. He probably hit the handlebars with his knee there, which is why they're getting that uh, ice spray on to try and get him into the bike race. But uh, 61, Gregory Rust. 
This is all the chaos and all the uh, stories that unfold at the end of a bike race like Paris-Roubaix. Fortunately, we're getting a chance to see some of them. But in the very famous showers here in the velodrome of Roubaix, it's amazing the stories that get untold after these riders have spent six, six and a half hours in the saddle. It must be the most welcome sight in the world. This is a most unusual race like no other in the world of cycling. You never see riders of this quality riding behind the big pack ever. And yet you're just seeing Pizzato, Gregory Rast, Sylvain Chavanel, all placed out of the race at the moment, fighting to get back in it. And when they do get back in it, if they get back in it, they will find that one man has gone. Tom Bonin still on his own. Right, they're taking that left-hand turn now, the, the cars are, you might hear the horns, the horns have, have been uh, hit by the team manager there, just to let them know that there are riders coming up through the gap, these guys communicate all the time with each other, when you're driving in a race car, it's not a question of looking in front of you, you've got to be looking all around, because these yep. guys come by on the left, the right, through the middle, sometimes almost over the top. Well, uh, they're great drivers of these vehicles, they're well aware of what's going on around them, but there have been some very nasty accidents in history. And not least was the crash of the American Davis Finney in the classic Liège Baston Liège uh, when he hit the back of a car when it came to a stop and went straight through the window. To as much of his advantage as he could, and he realised now that everyone was losing a little bit of firepower, so he said, "Now I've got to do it by myself." And the best way to try and ride across to Tom Bonin is on this cobblestone section. So Juan Antonio Fletcher is prized a slight advantage uh, over the, the rest of that group there, but they're not letting him go quite as easily. Juan Antonio Fletcher, Eduard Bolsenhagen, Matthew Heyman, Ian Stannard. They are the four riders who are here for Team Sky and trying to put things to rights. But Bonin is holding them off just on a half a minute advantage. So Fletcher goes around that corner. They're halfway through this section of cobblestones, a five-star rating at uh, mons en pevel And he realizes this is the moment to try and take his responsibility. A little bit of water getting flowing, if that's at all possible. Out of the saddle, he's got the big gear going. He's got to ride across a 28-second gap. And that uh, corresponds to around about half a kilometer or 500 yards. 28 seconds, the gap, and there's trouble there. Ryder of Coffey has lost his pedals completely. And if he doesn't watch out, he's going to get hit from behind. This is desperate moments again down there. Well, in fact, it's a Katusha rider, I think. Yeah, that was uh, Luca Paolini uh, had a problem there. It, it looked as if he had a problem with his pedal. He was trying to get his foot back yep. into his pedal. It just kept slipping off. As uh, now we can see the chase starting behind Tom Bonin. Well, we hope it's the chase down behind Tom Bonin. Here comes Sylvain Chavanel. He's got himself a big group now up behind, trying to get back up to the leaders. The battle of the cobblestones now, 28 miles still to ride here. The peloton is completely dissipated. There's a group of about 16 trying to get up to one Tom Bonin, who is 28 seconds off the front. And this has been an amazing journey so far. There is the lone figure of Tom Bonin now, as he comes off sector 10 of the cobblestones. And then the camera pans up, and there is the chase. It's not a done deal just yet. It is not a done deal for Tom Bonin here this afternoon, but slowly but surely the heads of state are starting to rise to the top end of this bike race because of the pressure of Juan Antonio Fletcher. Alessandro Balan is the rider there in second place. 28 seconds the gap now. Bonin has not run away with it. They've started to recover by that strong challenge by Juan Antonio Fletcher. They've now got their other man up here too in Edvald Boysenhagen for Team Sky. And so it could mean that now Fletcher is trying to weaken them so Boysen Hagen can have his day as the peloton come off the cobblestones. It's all a question of survival now here this afternoon. I think he's waiting. Yep. Uh, what do you reckon? He's just getting himself into a position to get himself nice and comfortable. He knows he's taken the risk here of going out on a move like this. He's not going to wait. It's for them to come up to him this afternoon. He's cruising over the smoothest part of the, the road, and I think he's going to put the hammer down every time he hits a cobblestone section because that is where he is stronger than anybody else in this bike race. 
this is the chase group then they're regrouping game Boysenhagen just slipped off to the right of our picture there for the moment uh, they've uh, heavily reduced this chase group because that's Alessandro Balan second from the end of the line the instant is still here as you look into the distance now the clouds are coming in but still hopefully no rain will come our way this is Fletcher who's now got himself at the back of the group well what a day it really has been today we've seen these riders when we got to the Aremberg Forest you know there were eight riders in the lead there uh, but it was in the league group when trouble started straight away there was a big crash in that league group uh, Grisha Janusky well for Germany was the first man to go down from NetApp he was in big trouble at that occasion and that caused a split in the break and I think the impetus too for the peloton to take up the chase and then further along the road there was trouble again because on a roundabout we saw uh, Tor Hushoft also in trouble. Now Hushoft has said this is the race he's wanted to win and he's on team BMC. So there are still two riders trying to get back up to the league group at the moment with Hushoft there. Uh, but Hushoff went down pretty heavily and then on the cobblestones another man who frankly has lost all interest in Paris-Roubaix today now the Italian favourite uh, Filippo Pazzato he also had a very heavy crash onto his hip and has been seen back at the car what a great race it has been though the way these rides have given their all flat out and somehow Tom Bonin has slipped away now he got away on his own he went first of all with his teammate Nicky Terpstra and then he broke away himself 31 and a half miles miles to go and he's gained uh, he was on sector 11 then of the cobbles ball but now he's just holding he's no longer running away with it he's settling into a rhythm now here this afternoon this is the second group on the road the chasing group and it's contained uh, some big serious uh, pre-race favorites as well probably the most important Juan Antonio Fletcher he's just on the left hand side there with a blue helmet taking a drink he's a Spanish rider who previously has finished second in Paris-Roubaix a little bit further back uh, BMC racing the American team have got their favorite to uh, Alessandro Balan in this group but not too far away I wouldn't be surprised to see Phil the return of Sylvain Chavanel who had a very bad flat tire it took him almost uh, a minute and a half to get a wheel from his team car but was at the back of the race well he's doing his own Paris-Roubaix and the ride of his life actually the uh, cameras keep picking him up but they don't identify exactly where he is but he does seem to be making progress up towards the front we've now entered sector nine here it's not a long sector it's only a mere 700 meters that's about uh, 800 600 yards or so and Bonin is pounding the pedals yet again this is an absolutely superb display by Tom Bonin it's going to make him it's going to double his fan base I'll tell you you know what Phil this man has specialized in this week of racing he's he's had the most incredible start of the season he's wallowed around for the last cups taking him out of the Tour de France but this year everything seems to have come back together again he's much more serious much more dedicated to the job in hand of being a professional bike rider and it's paying off in this week of racing and now he is opening up the gap every time we come to the cobblestone section because he's a specialist over these kind of cobblestone roads I think he's conserving his energy on the smooth roads in between the cobblestone sections and when he comes to these cobbles he's just giving it his all he's probably the only man in the race who wants the cobblestones to come thick and fast because he certainly can ride them well, how long do they sit on the back of a bull for eight seconds before you win the money this guy could do that he, he rocks and rolls his way to Roubaix hang on to that snorting charging <laughs> beast if you can for a mere eight seconds that's probably not what's going through Tom Bonin's head at the moment I thought you were what talking he's about Tom thinking Bonin about, what he's thinking about is getting to the next section of cobblestones he is enjoying his bike race here this afternoon you know he's got a relaxed approach to this race he won Tour of Flanders just seven days ago and now he can ride this race and if he doesn't win it well he will have shown some incredible panache and he really is putting the pressure on everybody else in this group he is repeating what Fabian Cancellara did in 2010 win virtually all of the top races at the start of the year poor Fabian broke his collarbone in at the Tour of Flanders last week and I bet he's watching this on television back home in Switzerland and wondering just where he might have been at this moment when Bonin was pounding the cobblestones you might just have noticed there that what sort of damage a race like Paris-Roubaix does to your body you could see all of his muscles there jiggling around because of the pressure now this is uh, the next group trying to pull themselves back up that's uh, Johan van Sommeren on Look the front go. he is trying to pull himself back into Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon and what a good job 
He's in a group of seven riders here, and uh, they were split away from the Balang group by that to surge forward a little bit earlier on, but it looks like they've now rejoined Balang. He's third man in our picture in the red and black, as uh, Matt Heyman looks over his shoulder and thinks, hello, somebody else coming up here, and they're going to wait. This is another group, and I don't think Heyman wanted this group to join them. Well, they've got another Team Sky rider coming across. Uh, Team Sky, I have to say, are in a fine tactical position here because they've got so many bike riders. The only problem is they're losing time consistently to this man. No, he's not climbing up into the <laughs> stars here this afternoon, but he is writing his name once again into the history books of Paris-Roubaix with a performance like this. Well, 40 kilometres to go, 25 miles left. 25 miles, that's less than an hour of racing at the speed these boys are going. Probably around about 50 three minutes of purgatory left for these riders more importantly they've only got 53 minutes to work out how they are going to bring back Tom Bonin well Bonin has had a phenomenal start to the season now these guys look a little bit ragged to me I would have to say Team Sky should be in a position to pull back Tom Bonin but Bonin with a 40 second advantage he's had eight victories so far this season Phil it's all started off with the seventh stage of the Tour of San Luis in uh, South America he started the season early because he wanted to be right for the classics he decided he didn't want to go to Terreno Adriatico which is one race which is very often used as preparation for Milan San Remo he wanted a harder race so he picked Paris Nice which we saw on NBC Sports as well we saw him ride a race which didn't suit his kind of riding ability but he needed that base to bring that base from Paris Nice through to Milan San Remo to Tour of Flanders and Paris Roubaix his week of the year Sylvain Chavanel taken out of the hunt by a flat tyre, now working his way steadily back. His group is getting bigger and bigger as he races forward. And so he'll be happy with progress, but will he contact that major chase group now just behind Bonin? I don't think he can. As we look down on the dazzle of the cobblestones, then we look up to the man that has tamed them today. As we now see this terrible section of cobbles here at just inside 24 miles from the finish. We are on sector eight now, Pont Thibault, and it's the sky, reach for the sky because they're trying to organize the chase to bring back the one man who is eluding them. Well, they've got the power now, and also you can see the orange jerseys over on the right-hand side. That's Team Rabobank. They've got their race leader in here as well, Martin Jangeli, and he will be hoping that uh, this organisation by Team Sky will pull back Tom Bonin. But in second position, you might notice the rider with the pale blue jersey. Well, that's Nicky Terpstra. He was in the move when Tom Bonin went a little while earlier on, and what he's trying to do is to break up the organisation. Operate. It might be working because the gap is up to 42 seconds. If he hits it's the magic minute. I don't think they'll see Tom Bonin before the showers, those famous showers at the back of the Roubaix Stadium. They're very archaic, but the water's hot, and that's what they want. Well, the water's hot, Phil, if you get in the first 30 or 40 <laughs> riders, but if you're at the back end of the main field, I'll tell you one thing, you're in for a cold shower this Spoken afternoon. Spoken from the heart of Paul Sherwin, who probably finished at the back end of the field on one occasion. Oh, on many Not occasions. Them, I'll give you that, Paul. Many occasions, but this is a race that I always got excited about. You get out of bed in the morning, you you, you know it's going to be a big day it's going to be a monumental day and that's why Tom Bonin is trying to write his name into this monument yeah he's won this race before one two three times but he wants to join Roger de Vlaming as a man who has won this race four times and he never had a single flat tyre in any of those four victories or a fall but you need luck believe me now Team Sky have brought up an extra man they now have five of their team here they've got their two pre-race favourites in uh, Hagen, Boyson Hagen and uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher so it's down to the other three to make the work well Boyson Hagen uh, his nickname uh, amongst the team is the, the bow dog and he'd be hoping to do a bow dog move here this afternoon but Nicky Terpstra is doing a great job he's the rider in second position Omega Pharma Lotto he's breaking up the organization of Team Sky and every time he does that every time he delays their organization it gives a little second here and another second there to Tom Bonin because look at the clock 45 now, seconds it is now let's see how Terpsa handles the cobbles as we go on to them 44 seconds is the gap and there's still seven sectors of cobbles to come and the gap is now 44 seconds you know with just about uh, 23 miles to go and this man is doing well well Tom Bonin's off another sector 
There is the man who steered 10 victories in Paris Bay, Patrick Lefebvre. In that car, is he going to get number 11 today? That's in fact Wilfred Peters, who once finished third in this event on the same team. Well, actually, Phil, uh, just to correct you, I don't do it very often, but uh, uh, the uh, the team manager you were talking about, he never actually goes into the car in uh, Paris Roubaix anymore because a couple a of years point. ago he had a little problem with his heart. He was getting so nervous with the, the way the race was unfolding that he said after that he prefers to come to Roubaix at the finish and actually watch it on TV. So he leaves all of the, the nasty work up to Wilfred Peters in the team car. Which is what he did in the Tour de Flanders last week you may have seen that uh, he was the first to reach his rider Tom Bonin and congratulate him at the finish and he may be doing it again for the fourth time here in Paris-Roubaix if it all goes according to Tom's plan he just looks a different man when he jumps on these cobblestones well looks over his shoulder there well you're gonna have to look back an awful long way Tom round about 750 yards is the gap when you convert 46 seconds here's the explanation you know Wilfred Peters himself has finished on the podium in Paris-Roubaix, he knows all about it, he finished in uh, third place a couple of years ago behind a certain Johan Museu who was his yep. teammate, he knows this race, he probably like me, like many of the other guys uh, sitting along the ex-bike riders who rode this race, like Sean Kelly, get excited, get motivated by Paris-Roubaix, I don't know what it is Phil, it's just because it's archaic, it's old-fashioned, it brings bike racing back to basics. I think what it does, it personifies the talent of the best side cyclists in the world give them a real challenge and they get their teeth into it and the best riders have won this event over the years gone by Sean Kelly was the number one cyclist for five years the great Irishman in fact they changed the rules to get him off being number one because they, he just could not resist winning everything he tried to ride he won this race twice and remains the only Irish cyclist to have done so and Bonin today is heading for his personal win number four. There's the composition now coming at us of the chasers, the poursuivants. Uh, Van Summeren, last year's winner, is in this movie. Rides for the American Garmin Barracuda team. There's the Sky Boys, Heyman, Stannard and uh, Luca Paolini came across recently. Tazato is up there, a good sprinter if he could get to use his sprint. It's an interesting group, but nobody is going to help. It's all down to Sky. And I'll give, I'll give a hats off as well to uh, Sebastian Turk because he was in the early morning breakaway and he's still in this group this afternoon the face of Tom Bonin his hands on top of the brake levers now now on the bottoms he's racing to win The work rate of this chase group here are still 47 seconds. They're riding at the same speed as the lone leader, Tom Bonin, now. And we are in at the last 21 miles from the stadium at Roubaix. Matty Heyman swings off. This is Team Sky. They've got five men in this group. Their two favourites are here. Nobody else is helping them. In the red and black going through picture, that is Alessandro Balan. Wait for a late attack from him when things get desperate. Well, Tom Bonin now, Phil, is around about a mile away from the seventh section of cobblestones to go, the section of cobblestones in the small town of Tompleuve. They're not very long, at 200 metres and 500 metres bolted together as they head down towards the Moulin de Vartin, but for Tom Bonin, that is his playground. A little bit of a problem here at the back for Stannard, looking down at his back wheel. Well, Stannard was uh, in that chase group. He's gone back for a drink, and I think uh, he's going to go straight back onto that group. He looks okay, the British cyclist here. A couple of bottles, a bit of freight growing underneath, and the Express going uh, underneath that, as we're now looking for Tom Bonin again, as he races a lone furrow here. 49, he's still pulling away. He's making hard work at gaining a second, but gaining a second, he is simple stretch here. Sector 7, a mere one star. It's not going to hurt anybody, is it? It's only a one star, but uh, in a few moments' time, he'll come off this section of cobblestones and go on to another part of the Tompleuve section, which is uh, up towards the Moulin, the windmill of Vertin. But what he'll be thinking about is a very long section down towards the end uh, between Cizouin and Borgel, because that long section is where Tom Bonin, I think, Phil, can start to consolidate his advantage. Nobody is riding as fast as Bonin can over these cobblestone roads, roads that go back 200 years and most of the year they're only ever used by farm tracks. Tom Bonham made his move 52 kilometres from the finish of the race 
and he's now got 52 seconds lead as the windmill sails are welcoming by but this is not Holland this is France heading towards Belgium this is the Moulin de Vertin and uh, it's got the wings out there this afternoon to turn around and it's almost like a metronome ticking out the time for Tom Bonin here this afternoon because his legs are going around a lot faster than those windmills look at the motorbike at the front there getting those images of Tom Bonin this is the sort of speed that you can experience if your name is Tom Bonin he's riding over these cobbles of this section Tom Pleur to the Moulin de Vartin at close to 30 miles an hour this has been one of the fastest Paris-Roubaix in many many years and Bonin he's like a racehorse Phil he's got the bit between the teeth and look at the clock 55 seconds it's very shortly he's going to be tickling that one minute margin that magical minute Yes, one whole minute, 60 seconds, separating the chasers from the champion. That's the way it appears at the moment. They're now onto the same section, the windmill crossing. And it's Team Sky now with it all to do here with their two champions up here. And I must say, Balladan has done everything right and he's taken advantage of the work of Team Sky for the American BMC squad. And it wouldn't surprise me near the end to see Balan try and go alone. But whether he can bridge to this man now because boy he is just having the time of his life just look at the way that machine is bouncing he's got uh, he's, he's a big strong bike rider Tom Bonham but you know because of his center of gravity because of his position on the machine he glides you might have just seen the front end bouncing a little bit that's why you don't hold the handlebars too hard when you're riding a race like Paris Bay you just allow the front end of the bike to try and find a little bit of a smoother ride as they come off now section number seven there's still six sections of cobblestone still to go and of course the one that Tom Bonham will be dreaming about now Phil is is the Carrefour de Labre, the corner, the corner of the Café de Labre, which is a very long, hard section. Again, Bonin, ten, these roads, these are the Flandre Artois, the Flemish, the, the Flanders of the northern part of France. He's 10 miles from that famous section, the last famous section on the course today, which has five stars. If he gets there with 58 seconds, uh, then he will definitely hold off to the finish. He's about 10 miles from the finish. We're literally halfway between now. The face of Tom Bonin here, tapping out the rhythm. The man that's been a world champion, he's won stage of the Tour de France, he's won the green jersey in the Tour de France. He's been a champion and a champion of everything. But all he wants now is a fourth victory in Paris Bay. What's he saying? Sorry, Paul, I couldn't <laughs> quite hear him. I was talking too loud myself. Well, Wilfred Peters uh, was, uh, he was, I think he'd be pretty happy with this situation this afternoon there. Bonin, look at that. You might just notice, by the way, on this uh, specialised bike that he's riding, Phil, if you look at the back end there, there's a there's a, a strange little curve, and at the front end also, when we can move forward, he's actually <laughs> got kind of a little suspension in there. Not 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 like the rock shocks that you would find on something like a mountain bike, but there's a kind of a gel in there that takes a little bit of the pounding out and makes it, if you can make it easy to ride over the cobbles, a little easier and a little bit more comfortable. Well, he's making it look very easy at the moment even the giant there was looking quite amazed at the advantage that uh, Tom Bonin has taken here an incredibly brave decision but he must have sensed the time was right to go so far from home take a teammate with him and gamble on leaving his teammate that is a man of supreme confidence here's last year's champion Van Summeren for the size of his bike he is a massive bike rider where's number one the champion of last year He's a guy who spends the majority of his career, Phil, working for others, helping others. He's helped guys like uh, Cadell Evans in the past when he was a, a member of the Lotto squad, but he's been brought on here to Garmin Barracuda to look after uh, riders in the big mountain passes. The amazing thing about Johan van Sommeren, Phil, is he can ride well on the flat, but he can also ride pretty impressively in the mountains. He grips those brake levers. He is the man of the moment, Tom Bonin as we're now looking at the face of this rider as it slowly goes darker with the dust of the day 56 seconds the gap he's 19 miles from the stadium <laughs> 30 kilometers absolutely dead as we look now only two sky boys at the front i've got a feeling that the pressure is coming off this group they're running out of power 
Well, you know, Tom Bonin made a very brave move, as you said, Phil, with 55 kilometers. Uh, that's about 35 miles of racing to go to the finish. He was with Juan Antonio Fletcher, who we're looking at here. He was with Alessandro Balan. That in itself was a very good composition for a breakaway. But he said, no, today's my day. Today's the day I want to stamp my authority all over this bike race. And he probably remembered just exactly how Fabian Cancellara won this race when he actually rode Tom Bonin off his wheel. He zigzags in and out, he follows the arrows, you only have to follow the crowd line to know which way it is around the back roads uh, to Roubaix. And then the last little section of cobblestones are totally smooth, believe me, and they're a mere third of a kilometre in length. It's almost a cursory salutation to the cobbles as you enter the stadium. This group now, I think, has lost a little bit of its firepower, there's nobody willing to help Sky, the gap is now almost one minute. Matty Heyman is the rider on the front for Team Sky and that uh, with that blue stripe down his helmet a former Commonwealth gold medalist in the road race a great man to have in your team but you know even with a firepower of a guy like Matty Heyman it's almost impossible to pull back Tom Bonin here this afternoon and again Phil he hasn't quite made that minute but I think in a couple of kilometres time uh, he will be going on to the next section of cobblestones and that's the section from uh, Cizouin to Borgel it's 1.3 kilometres long and don't be surprised to see see Bonin go over the one minute mark on that section of cobbles. Well we watch that because he actually lost two seconds, it's now gone up one so they're riding virtually the same speed. They're sitting at the back here, Juan Antonio Fletcher's been in the cars, he's now rejoining the group and there's another Saxo Bank there wants a little bit of assistance as well, may have a flat tyre, may just want a drink. You might have also noticed uh, the the, car, the Garmin Barracuda team car there uh, Phil coming up alongside, larger tyre onto the cars in a race like Paris-Roubaix because the, most of the cars, most of these modern cars they're so low that they actually touch down over the cobblestone so the, the managers will have a special set of tyres made for the event to lift them up so they don't smack the sump down on the middle of the cobblestones. Seems a very clever thing to do. That was uh, Tazato who has actually had his hand up in the air there from Saxo Bank. Holding at 58 seconds on our television screens, but we're hearing the race rep. Well, by Tomica, the way, he's only two seconds in it. It's only two seconds in it, but Tomica now is at one kilometre, 600 yards away from the next section of cobblestones as this group. The, the guy at the back, by the way, Phil, the Europe car rider, he was, in fact, is the... Uh, rider who was in the breakaway very early on this morning he was looking extremely stronger Sebastian Turco yeah he started the move after we caught the break of the day and he's managed to hold on to this group he's not contributing much now this is Tosato seems to have solved his problem uh, that number 15 that is uh, Omega Farmer quick step rider he's just uh, hovering around in that group so the gap now down to 57 seconds, those uh, next sections of cobblestones for Tom Bonin can't come too quickly. We are looking at arguably the strongest bike rider in the world at this moment in time. Tom Bonham with eight victories this year. He's still on course to get his ninth and his fourth win in the Queen of the Classics. Look at the crowd. Tomica, Tomica, Tomica. It's the Belgians' language affectionate way to call their boy home. And now we're heading into Siswang à Bourgel. And this is a fourth four-star section, Paul. Phil, these are two sections bolted together. The six-to-go section of cobblestones from Siswang to Borgel to Wana. 2.4 kilometres long. This is Tom Bonan. Look how smooth he looks. He sits nice and high on his machine. He's rolling over that massive big gear. He's not wearing any gloves at all, Phil, because he wants to be able to feel the cobblestones. I never used to wear gloves either when I rode Paris-Roubaix, and you might think you get uh, you might get blisters, but you don't. You get used to riding without hands, without gloves. I mean, <laughs> it's beyond <laughs> without hands, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. And there it is. One minute has come up now. We heard it from the race. It's now showing on the screens. He is just over 15 miles from the finishing line. 26 kilometres. I thought he faltered about two or three kilometres ago, but he's back on his home ground now. He is driving on the cobbles. 
one minute one second well I uh, just had a little quick look at the uh, I just had a little quick look there Phil at uh, the onboard computer that we've got here and in fact Bonin at the moment people always want to know how much energy a bike rider is uh, using at a moment like this he's actually burning a thousand calories an hour with the effort that he's putting in at the moment that's a lot of sandwiches that's what I call a great diet as we now come into the last 26 kilometers of the day of racing here we're looking at 15 miles plus so about 40 minutes is what Bonin has to survive now that is an awful long time when you're holding off all of the stars of Paris-Roubaix 25 and a half kilometers that's uh, 17 miles of racing and he's still got the one minute mark but look at him he loves this cobbles look at how much the bike is bouncing around here there you can see that little bit of the suspension thing just at the back there well it's Tom Bonin who's setting the pace it's time to remind you all that they are on a very quick time today I'm not sure they're on the record of Peter Post the great Dutchman who sadly passed away last year record which has stunned the passage of time but they are running over half an hour ahead of schedule now and the Arrivé 25 kilometers to the stadium just over 15 miles to go look at the flags over there there's a flag from the uh, the Bruges football team over to the right hand side but the flag of France the dust that's been kicked up by these bikes and the motorbikes that follow the race here this afternoon Juan Antonio Fletcher himself taking the responsibility of trying to pull Tom Bonin back into the fold but they're going to have a very hard job to do that here this afternoon this is a long section of cobblestones the giants of Flanders here you can see at the side of the road I would have to say Tom Bonin is going to become a great giant as he comes off that section of cobblestones again he is riding as you've said Phil like a man possessed he knows every centimeter of this race and he wants to make sure that he rides into this velodrome on his own it's a big ask it's a very brave move to take this kind of a solo effort especially when you're a man like Bonin who doesn't need to do it he could sit in the main pack and come out and win this race in the sprint but no he wants to do it like a man he wants to do it the old-fashioned way the tough way well the record of Peter Post is 45 kilometers an hour and they were certainly averaging that for the first two hours he did it back in 1965 and it was a standout and always has been ever since but you know it must be in danger today of being beaten and what a fourth victory that would be for Tom Bonin 45.129 kilometers an hour is the fastest average speed ever recorded on this event now that would be uh, about 28 and a bit just on 28 miles an hour it is absolutely possible I would say Phil because after all the first two hours of this race this morning we're on off at an average speed of almost 48 kilometers an hour yeah that is uh, 27 28 miles an hour and that's uh, pretty impressive this is the second part of this uh, section of six to go just it's look a, at him he's, look he at the way he's it. riding the cobbles you just look at the front wheel though the way it uh, picks its way over the smoothest part that he can find these roads are unbelievable these roads are archaic they're hard they're they're tough but Bonin is enjoying himself here this afternoon you know if you look at the month of March that he had he won a stage in Paris Nice the second stage the only stage that actually suited any of the sprinters then he went on to win the Grand Prix E3 which is a race that the Belgians hold very dear to their heart over many of the difficult roads of Flanders then he took Ghent Wavelgem last weekend he took Parrot the Tour of Flanders this afternoon he's riding real out. look at the way he's going around that corner no slowing down at all for Tom Bonin he just danced around that corner immediately sought out the sand on the left of the road you have to be very careful on that sand because sometimes they camouflage a little hole or a nasty cobblestone sticking sharply out that can pierce the tyre you've got to stay very much alert at this stage of the race they're suffering from fatigue as well I would say they're suffering from moments of desperation up here just now because they know they've got to shut this down in the next few kilometres it's gone out now to 63 seconds well the man looking for his bow is Juan Antonio Fletcher he's the rider on the front for Team Sky finds a smooth bit of road oh a little bit of a slip there I think that was Sir uh, Lars Boom Joyeuse Pack. happy Easter to everybody out there as well let's not forget there's the Easter bunny which they like in France but I'm sure I'll be ho 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 hoping to get home I hope you're my Easter egg's been delivered I was going to say you're the sort of man that would bite the ear off first 
63 seconds it briefly went to 64 inside 15 miles now 14 and a bit miles left to ride to the finish Tom Bonin goes faster when he's on the cobblestones and when he's on the smooth pavement this is the chase behind there's always disarray on the cobbles it's the strong men set the pace and that's the way it is the rest just hang on the frustration that uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher must be feeling because Juan Antonio Fletcher in the first position there and Alessandro Berlin in fourth position they were in the right place at the right time yep. they were with Tom Bonin but he just popped them off his wheel we've seen him pull that be a same trick in the past Tom Bonham when he's gone on to win but much nearer the finish never where he went this time as we continue to look at Team Sky now the pacemaking here continuing to be made this is now Boysenhagen in the spot of bother that's a bit of a surprise actually I didn't think that Eddie would uh, drop back I thought he would be going forward at this stage but he's not too happy with the cobblestones the man from Norway well I think Phil he's put a lot of effort in to try and uh, help his own teammate Juan Antonio Fletcher that's why he's paying for it now and this is also Matthew Heyman who is unhitching the Sky team I'm afraid he's going into a bit of an eclipse one minute exactly 22 kilometers soon they'll see 20 kilometers from the finish Alessandro Bolan has been forced to do the work now with the collapse of the sky team he's going to have to do it all the himself the now Phil the grimace very shortly that is the TGV by the way the Tron Grand Vitesse the high speed train that links uh, Europe and uh, and uh, Europe That's the and Euro the Star itself, I yeah, think, bound on its for way London. from London. Yep. So Tom Boonen now will be lining up for the next section of cobblestones, which is uh, just around the corner from here. It's the cobblestones of Confin en Pavel. They are awful. I can tell you from experience, they are made of a very dark blue granite, and they're very slippery indeed. And Bonin will know that. Oh. Look at his face. I've seen Tom Bonin do some wonderful performances, but not one like this. His face is a picture. It is one of total energy for the job in hand, the enthusiasm. It's hurting, but it's one of those pleasing hurts because he knows it is a winning hurt. No one is going to catch this guy. The only thing that will stop him now is a mechanical. 63 seconds. He's coming down to 20k to go. Well, Phil, even if he has a mechanical, he's, he's got, got a minute and four seconds. He can probably build himself another bike with the advantage he's got here. <laughs> this now as we look back is the gap the big long gap and as they say in cycling parlance out of sight is very often out of mind except I don't think he's out of mind on this occasion but they just can't catch him they're doing everything they can they've run out of men all the bullets have been used up back here this is Martin Vinance at the front at the moment now for Rabobank uh, but th they're just throwing in what help they can now there's nobody left there's no longer a concerted effort Balan knows if he's going to catch him he's got to go now he can't wait any longer if Tom Bonin can survive another 10 kilometers what you'll start to see in the main field is the infighting the guys will start to be thinking about their second place their third place their fourth place and they'll stop thinking about trying to catch Tom Bonin and then all of a sudden Bonin at 10 kilometers to go if he's still got that one minute margin he's got this race in the bag he's about three kilometers just over a mile and a bit to the big section of, co of cobblestones at the Carrefour de l'Arbre the junction of the trees and that's where he's now bound for being drawn along by the feeling of another cobblestone he would have to rebuild the foundations of his house to display these because he's got three and there's a fourth on its way I think in the next uh, 35 minutes or so well I think he'll go inside of 35 minutes around about 25 I think will be the speed we might see coming from Tom Bonin here this afternoon again the TGV Train Grand Vitresse that train by the way can run at 300 kilometers an hour which is 180 miles an hour yep. but it actually holds the land speed record for trains because they actually recorded it one time doing 500 kilometers an hour it's a 300 miles an hour it's apparently the only thing that goes around Roubaix faster than Tom Bonin at a minute 13 Venus has had a flat tyre here and it's not actually Venus this one it's his teammate Lars Bohm Lars who has Boom. got himself back in Lars Bohm who's been the uh, cyclocross champion of Holland for 10 years in a row unbelievable this man but now he's turned his mind across to racing in the road and he's been very very successful with his transition and we are hearing there is a huge crowd on the next sector of Pave and we're not surprised As we look through the bicycle wheels briefly there, that was Lars Bohm getting back to the race. This rider is now on Canfin en Pavel. It's not the bad one. We're heading for the bad one shortly. 
We are hearing on race radio there is a massive crowd awaiting Tom Bonin on the next sector of cobbles. Well, Phil, if I can give just, just a little bit of history back, it was on this section of cobblestones when Tom Bonin, as a young 21-year-old, was looking after George Hincapi. Hincapi crashed into that, that gutter, ditch there. Exactly on the right-hand side of the road, and Bonin had to carry on alone, and he finished second in Paris-Roubaix on that occasion. Did we believe at that time that this man was going to be as good as he is today? I'm not sure we did, but he's proving to be incredible. We knew he was good, and in fact it was Hincapi's uh, manager at the time, Johan Bruniel, who had spotted Tom Bonin as a youngster and took him onto the American teams. Uh, but he couldn't hold on to him, and he went back to the Belgian squads, and he has developed exactly as Bruniel foresaw. He is an incredible one-day rider. He's a good stage race rider, but he's not a Tour de France winner. He simply can't climb the high mountains, but he can do everything else and twice as good as anyone else. A minute 21, a minute 22 as we speak. Well, this is Tosato on the front now in the uh, light blue jersey there of Team Saxo Bank. Uh, I think everyone's really this afternoon now, Phil, getting themselves into survival mode. Number 91 there, you can see he's the rider, Luca Paolini. He nearly came unstuck uh, very nicely a little bit earlier yep. on. These are a nasty section of cobbles here. They are bouncing around. You see everybody's riding over to the right-hand side or the left-hand side of the road to try and find a little bit of smoothness, a little bit of rest away from what has been a, a jaw-jarring a jaw race here this afternoon. Good ride there by Lars Bohm. He took a bike change rather than change a wheel, and he got back very, very quickly into that chase group. But again, he's used energy at the wrong end of the race and can't drive up to the rider in the lead. A minute 24. We are heading towards 10 miles from the finish now. We're very close to the hardest stretch of cobblestones and Bonin is nearly there. Just have a look at the front end of his bike there. You can see it bouncing around. He's, uh, as you said, got slightly lower tyre pressure than they normally had. He's off that section of cobblestones. Those flags that you notice there are the flags of the Lion of Flanders, the Vlaams Alu. And this afternoon, I think we will have to say that definitely Tom Bonin has been christened the new Lion of Flanders. Tom the Tornado, as the Belgians call him. Uh, but I would call him Tom the Lion of Flanders. You're absolutely... Oh, and there's a problem at the back here too. And this is a sky rider. That's Matty Heyman, the Australian. A flat tyre, I think. He may have fallen there, but he's back in the saddle now. But it's all gone wrong for Sky in the last couple of kilometres. They've lost their energy. They've slipped off the back. And the race has split up. But you might have noticed, Phil, just on that camera lens there, just a little bit of... Uh, a few spots of rain starting to appear here this afternoon. Tom, go for it. Tom, go for it. Look <laughs> at that. Well, he's, he absolutely is going uh, for it here this afternoon. Now, I hope he gets over this next section of cobblestones carefully because with that little bit of rain and moisture starting to come down, the first part of the cobblestones of the uh, Carrefour de l'Arbre are known as the Pavé Bleu, the blue cobblestones. They are treacherous if you get a little bit of a coat of moisture on them. Well, I'll tell you what, this is Lars Bohm who had his problem earlier, got the bike change. He's now having to retire and get up on his own because the, all the firepower has gone from the break whatever happened to Matty Heyman took him out of the hunt he was a strong man in the chase for Sky we've seen Boysenhagen in trouble Sky has lost total control of the chase group I expected to see Balan move here but he's not on our camera at the moment it is Lars Bohm who's going for it as we head up to this major stretch of cobblestones and wait till you see the people here they are waiting to welcome Tom Bonin one minute 19 the gap and we're just about 10 miles from the finish this is the famous Carrefour oh, de he he'd gone round that corner like he is going on the flat piece of road. It's a five-star rating, over two kilometres long, 1.2 miles. This is the section where everybody knows if you want to win Paris-Roubaix, you put the hammer down. But if you're alone in the lead with 10 miles to go, Tom Bonin must be starting to feel extremely confident. This, in fact, Phil, this is no longer a French crowd here. This is half of Flanders who've come out to the top end of France. Well, they've come over for the border. It's only about five miles to Belgium, a little bit longer from this particular point across to Belgium. But Tom Bonin now has entered his gallery. The crowd are just shouting in a crowd of noise all the way to Roubaix. This has been a demonstrative show on Easter Sunday in France by a Belgian. A minute and 11 seconds. He gains time on the cobbles. Look at the way he's pedalling. He's using his torso. He's using everything he can to hammer down. He wants to destroy those pedals on the bike underneath him there, Phil, this afternoon. And what it's doing is it's pushing him at speeds of 30 miles an hour over these roads, some of which 
which are more than 200 years old. These roads date back to the Napoleonic times. Napoleon's troops marched over here. One man is now chasing at a minute and 10 seconds. A former world champion in the cyclocross discipline of the sport, Lars Boom, is in second position on the road, but he's going to have to do something special if he thinks he's going to catch Tornado Tom here this afternoon. Well, for Lars Boom, this is typically in his street as well. As Paula said, he's been for 10 years the world champ. He's been the world champion and the national champion in those 10 years for his native country of Holland. They race over fields with their bikes on the shoulders. It's a winter sport. But on these roads, he could feel he's back home riding a cyclocross. Bonham fights his bike like a bucking bronco as he turns left. As he goes into the crowd, the Belgian flag flies in France as they welcome now, if he gets there, what would be Belgium's 56th win in the Paris-Roubaix. Well, Phil, uh, this section of uh, cobblestones, the Carrefour de l'Arbe, it earns its name from a small cafe just at the top end, at the end of this section of cobblestones, called the Café de l'Arbe. It's a lonely little place right in the middle of uh, nowhere, and I think it only ever makes money this day of the year. Oh, there must be other days if it's still there, Paul. <laughs> Airway, a minute and nine seconds. Uh, Bonin, uh, Bone rather, has pulled back a second on Tom Bonin. 15.4, just 10 miles, like slightly under 10 miles to the finish. There's the flag of the Basque country of Spain flying across the fields. Well, let me give Tom Bonin a little bit of uh, good news this afternoon because the, the flags in that direction will indicate that once Tom gets off the uh, co cobblestones of the Carrefour de l'Arbe, he will pick up a very nice tailwind, and I would think that will help him uh, recover a fraction. Still there, we've got Alessandro Balan. He's in third position on the road. Just look how nasty these roads are. But Balan is trying to pull himself back up to Lars Boom. That group, which was a large group of riders, have been shattered by the Pave de Labre. And there's the little cafe I was just telling you about on the left-hand side. Hi, Joe. Thank you, our cameraman. It looks to me as though it's undergone a facelift there. It's brought some blue tiles. There's the crowd who have been buying all the beer and coffee in that little cafe shop as they're now the lone figure of Tom Bonham ploughs a furrow through the crowd 15 kilometres to go, 9 miles to the finish Lars Bohm, one of the greatest riders over the bad fields and bad roads in the world is now trying to catch him while Balan is also in the mix still for a high finish the crowd here are going ballistic because they know they're seeing a man who's putting in an incredible athletic performance off the Pave de Labre now 110 back to Lars Boom, 118 back to Alessandro Balan's group but Tom Bonin here this afternoon Phil knows now with 15 kilometres 9 miles of racing left to go he's only got 20 minutes left in Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon and he will try and make sure that nobody ever sees him again until he stops in the velodrome so Balan knows now he can't care who's sitting behind him he's got to ride this course it looks like one Antonio Fletcher is sitting right behind him at the moment as Balan sets the low and it's not too far up to last Bohm here it is Fletcher who's tucked in just behind him and the 117 there is Mathieu Le Dianou of France and that's a very very good ride by that Frenchman it looks as though Bohm maybe picked Herbie be about chasing three he was 12th last year last Bohm in the Paris-Roubaix which was an outstanding appearance by him and he was about to finish second but I think now he's got his hands full well he's uh, back now we are with Bonin look at him he's arched back there he's bouncing around on those cobblestones he's on the, the section called the Gruson this is the third section left to go there's only one long section after this and Bonin will know this to perfection he knows where he's going he's just got to get there 14 kilometres, 8 miles to go, Bonin in charge and there's four riders getting together behind him. Just look at that, these aren't bad these cobbles, he's got all of the major cobblestones behind him now. They get smoother ironically as he gets towards the stadium and the crowd are lifting him all the way. Well, you can see the, the red, yellow and black uh, hats. You can see the red, yellow and black flags. Those are the flags of Belgium. We're actually not very far from the border. We're about four miles away from the border with Belgium at this point here. Bonin will come off this section of cobblestones at uh, Gruzon. He will now turn to the right. He'll pick up a tailwind now as he heads down to the small town of Chiron. 
I hope the train's not running today, by the way, because in the past they're going through, uh, once they've gone through Chirin, they go through a railway crossing, and in the past we've seen the railways actually close down and falsify the race result. It has happened. In fact, riders have been disqualified for going through the crossing when the gates were closed. At least they were alive to get disqualified because that's not uh, to be recommended. But uh, the referees will be ready for that now. Tom Bonham would be given a restart with the same gap when he stops there, but he's got to get there first. We'll see. This is still Lars Bohm now. As he's gone back into the field as the field now... Uh, field, uh, at least let's just say four riders as they get together here. There's well, only just about a mile of cobblestones, 1.5 kilometres of cobblestones left after they come off this. Well, talk about man against man. Uh, Alessandro Balan now is the rider riding through the middle of the cobblestones. This section of cobblestones, by the way, uh, the cobblestone section uh, of the Gruzon Danube was so punctured, by the way. Oh, there he is. Oh, that's bad luck. That's really bad luck. He's got the neutral motorbike there alongside him. But this is a slow change as the, the mechanic ah. almost falls off his bike. He was in uh, a great position there to get himself a top five finish in Paris-Roubaix. Now, all of a sudden, he's on the defensive. He's got to try and get himself back into this race. Oh, that's really sad for him because the Frenchman was on the right of his life here would have gone down as one of his finest ever performances he might still do uh, but really that is so unlucky at that stage of the race as the that's Paulini he's just come up behind him there Yep, I was just starting to get into the little story there, Phil, that this section of cobblestones was in fact uh, renovated a couple of years ago that's why it looks quite as smooth as it does so Ladan Yu is going to ride uh, his heart out here this afternoon. He's the rider with the blue shorts there, the Frenchman, the red, white and blue flag just over on the right-hand side, a flying high for him. But it's the uh, flags in the stadium here, which will be uh, black, yellow and red of Belgium for this man, Tom Bonin. Well, we're in the stadium, of course, giving you this commentary and the crowd's here. Now, Paul is absolutely right. I can only see Belgian flags looking around the stadium at the moment. Uh, they're getting ready for the arrival of the King because this is Tom Bonin on smooth roads again now. The gap continues to go up to a minute and 19, 12 kilometres to go. Bonin is a minute 20 up with just seven miles to go. We're looking at the three chases now. There were four, but sadly, Mathieu Le Danu has had a flat tyre and he's now chasing back alone. That's really sad for the Frenchman. He's 27 years of age, but he was on the ride of his life today. He's never been in a podium in a classic. And to podium out in Paris Roubaix at his home nation of France, that would have been something special. He's got to get back there now. Well, this is Bone and Paul as he races towards the end. The pain is now starting to disappear from Tom Bone in this afternoon because he can accept the pain that he's been putting his body through over the last uh, hour of this race because he now knows that uh, there's a, a cobblestone uh, trophy waiting for him at the finish line because Tom Bonin is not going to get caught here this afternoon unless of course his bike breaks the team car breaks and all hell goes against him but I don't think that's going to happen when you've got great form everything seems to just go right we're in the town of Hem at the moment and uh, Bonin zigzagging his way through He's always out of sight now, of course, in the towns here as he heads towards Roubaix. A minute 22. They know, they must know, they're not going to catch him very soon. They're going to think about how to outwit one another for second and third in Paris-Roubaix. Tom Bonin is bound for a record equaling fourth win now with only 11 kilometres to go. Six and a half miles, that's all. Alessandro Balan, he really is on some terrific form and yet he hasn't been able to do anything about that attack by Bonin and neither has Juan Antonio Fletcher. Bonin was just too strong when he put the hammer down with his teammate Nicky Terpstra and they started this move. It was a brave move to start at 55 kilometres to go, but look at the speed of Bonin. He will not give up at all. He's now in the small town of Willems, not too far away from the railway station, the railway crossing, and hopefully he'll get across there nice and safely. And then he really, Phil, in all honesty, only has one section of cobblestones left to go, and that, of course, is the section from Willems to Hem, because the last section of cobblestones really just outside the stadium here... Over. It's pretty much ornamental. The gate is up, he's over. That's as where it once caused amazing controversy when they stopped the riders. Some riders jumped the crossing. They were disqualified when they got to the finish in Roubaix for going through a closed barrier. Uh, but that's not going to happen to Bonin. He's through. A minute 22 he has in hand. He's almost looking quite relaxed there now. 
Well, you might just look at his position there in the middle. You see he's got his hands on top of the handlebars. He's actually getting down into his time-trialling position. Team manager Wilfred Peters comes up alongside him. He says, come on, Tomica, there's only now 10 kilometres to go, six miles. That really shouldn't take him very much more than 12 or 13 minutes. Well, the riders who have done the double in recent times, uh, that's winning the Tour de Flanders one week and the Paris-Roubaix the next. The obvious one is Fabian Cancellara, who did it, and Cancellara winning, winning the double in 2010. And others who have done it, Tom Bonin himself, did it in 2005, and he's about to do it again in 2012 quite amazing when you look at the quality of these three chases here Lars Boom champion of the world in the cyclocross Juan Antonio Fletcher who's finished second in Paris-Roubaix then in, in that group as well Alessandro Balan and they continue to lose time on Tomica Bonin that's his nickname and that of course is the flag of Belgium and it's right behind him now the wind is favorable a minute 30 the gap uh, to me the clock is telling us that the riders behind now know they have lost Paris Roubaix they are not going to catch up with this man who broke away so far away from the finish it seemed like a sporting suicide but it, Tom knew himself better than we did let's not forget Phil uh, this man has returned after a couple of years in the doldrums to the man that he was many many years ago he's shown us since the start of this year he started winning bike races in January this year in South America in the Tour of San Luis went on to come up Qatar and Oman but then this week a month of racing in Belgium he has been so dominant he's been on a different level to everybody else and right now he's proving that once again it was a dangerous move but it was a brave move but Bonin knew in his body that he was going to do it heading up to five miles or eight kilometers from the finish a minute and a half you can't bridge that Tom would have to stop to be caught now he's running to victory confidence all the way the roads stay narrow and protected now from the wind as we're heading to the village of M and the second last stretch of cobblestones and we don't count the first stretch to come because it is just nothing and now Tom knows he's almost home well he needs to get off this section uh, very carefully as well because I remember when Henny Kuiper went on to win this race many years ago he got to this section of cobblestones with about a 40 second advantage over everybody else and uh, when he got to the end he took one of these corners and his tyre popped out and he had to wait for a long time for the team mechanic to come up alongside and change his machine Bonin knows this section of cobbles look at the way the confidence with the way he throws his bike into those corners it's amazing and look at those thick tyres he's riding he's made a good choice on his tyres today they've ridden these cobblestones well for him they're so heavy a professional would never be seen training on such heavy tyres but this isn't a normal bike race Tom Bonin has ridden it like the best champion this race has ever seen no he has but look at the way he's actually riding on the cobblestones he's avoiding that bit of tarmac to the side of the road because that tarmac is littered with little potholes and if you hit one of those you could very well find yourself uh, getting a, a flat tyre because of it Bonin now counting down the time of 7.2 kilometres that's inside of four and a half miles left to go to the finish line it's going to take him now probably Phil not much more than 10 minutes and I'll tell you what he will enjoy riding around this velodrome and the, the flags of Flanders and the flags of Belgium will be high as a kite takes me back to a little memory of uh, the week when Tom Bonham went uh, and reconnoitred the course and rode the cobblestones with his teammates his teammates went too fast and he had to tell them to slow down boy what a difference a few days makes and now are we sure we actually believe that story anymore <laughs> maybe that was a little bit of a psychological blow that he was putting into the Belgian newspapers these are the three chasers uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher but look at the clock it's amazing the clock is telling us everything about the way Tom Bonin is riding this afternoon because it's a minute and 35 seconds his advantage those are the cobbles those are the cobbles of the northern part of France which make this race so famous three riders two of them pre-race favorites the one up front very definitely the pre-race favorite and the last bow well we didn't think he would do quite as well as this having finished 12th last year but he certainly had a great ride today to get into this chase group this is the big crowd now cheering all the way off the end of sector number two just one short sector of three tenths of a kilometer remains about 400 yards that's all that's still to come 
Yes. As bon uh, Tom Bonin now heads for home, way ahead of the field. Well, the next town that he will come into is the town of Hem. Then there's a slight uphill drag towards the uh, the top of the outskirts of Roubaix. He'll plunge down into Roubaix, and then he will come onto that very long, famous boulevard that every bike rider in the world wants to ride alone on, on their way into the velodrome. A minute 35. He'll ah. say, thanks very much. I'll take all of that, but I'll still keep the pressure on. Look at and this. Uh, <laughs> there's his supporter. <laughs> He's actually shouting through his megaphone at the same time as showing a self-portrait as Bonin races on now. I think that board showing 1 minute 35, they show that also to the chasers by the way. It's not just a bias thing with the leader. Uh, Bonin will think, oh, they can't catch me now. Nobody can bridge that gap. His only fear now is a stoppage. Phil, Six kilometres. I've got to think back to uh, the, all of the performances that I've ever seen come from Tom Bonin. This has got to be one of his best performances ever. Yeah. He's usually in the past used his sprinting ability to get himself victory in races. But here he's gone for the solo effort. He didn't have to do it. He could have waited. He could have stayed with that group of three riders behind him and won the sprint quite easily from that group. That's what's made him a champion. 117 races this man has won in his professional career. Uh, but a sprinter who knows he could win with the group chose to be very special and stand out and he's done that today he certainly has these guys they've still got to keep uh, cooperating Look at the position there of uh, Alessandro Balan on the American squad uh, BMC racing what a week he's had if you take Tom Bonin out of the uh, situation it could have very well been a great week for Alessandro Balan and BMC racing but they've came, come up against somebody who is probably on the form and condition of his life he has been absolutely outstanding all day today, Tom Bonin. As soon as the screw was turned very tightly in the forest of Arenberg, with about 60 miles to race, he was always seen near the front. And instead of waiting, he decided to go for it so far away from Roubaix. Well, now he's virtually in the suburb of Roubaix. It's not long now. Well, this is the town of Hemp. There on the left-hand side, you can see five kilometres to go to the finish. That's 3.1 miles for Tom Bonin to, to ha hand, end out what has been a, a marvellous Easter Sunday afternoon for him. Clouding over, I have to say, but the rain has stayed away. Tom Bonin now heading to do the double of the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. Now, as Bonin races towards the finish now, he repeats what he did in 2005. That was the double of Flanders and Roubaix. He follows in the wheel tracks of Fabian Cancellara, the rider we saw crash last week in the Tour de Flanders and now watches this on television as he nurses a collarbone broken in four places. It would have been interesting, Paul, today to see what Cancellara could have done about Bonin. Well, it would have been interesting, but with ifs and buts, we can make a lot of different ways to the race to uh, come out. But for Tom Bonin, he rode the race that he wanted to ride here this afternoon, and he's uh, done it to absolute perfection, I would have to say. And now he can enjoy the last uh, 4.5 kilometres as uh, the chasing group of three riders will also now ride into the velodrome. But for one of these guys, Phil, there's three riders in that group, one guy will not get himself onto the podium it would be such a prestigious thing to climb onto the podium in second or third position alongside Tom Bonin who will today equal the record of Roger de Vlaming the famous Belgian rider who won this race on four occasions well in that chase group behind you know Balan and Fletcher have been on the podium before Fletcher's finished second and third twice and Balan has finished third and fourth Lars Bohm, and I'm not sure, but I think this is only his second time he's attempted Paris-Roubaix, and he was 12th in his first attempt last year, and could well be on, because he packs a sprint finish, and the track is banked, and he will. F I would favour him to win the sprint. I feel sorry for the guy who finishes fourth. It's a tough day after uh, being out on the attack, chasing Tom Bonin here this afternoon but that's the way the sport is Bonin doesn't have to worry about any of those computations Phil or any of those calculations because for him it'll be a lone ride around the velodrome it's 500 meters round this velodrome and I'll tell you one thing he will enjoy every 500 meters of it as he salutes the crowd he's not too far away now 3.5 kilometers that's just over two miles of racing left that's going to take him uh, not much more now than four minutes to get to the finishing line Bonin still continues to uh, concentrate there he's in that time trialing position there as he 
cuts around all of these corners he's not far he's up at the top of the climb now and very shortly he'll start to plunge down towards the outskirts of this velodrome this very very famous velodrome of Roubaix well I did reference last bone finishing 12th last year but I've just checked my notes in fact he has this is his third attempt at Paris Roubaix I don't know whether the first one actually counts now because he was actually outside of the time limit uh, coming into the stadium so he wasn't listed on the result it's interesting that Paul but there is an actual time limit of 5% on finishing this event there is the velodrome on the right hand side of Roubaix and that's where Tom Bonin is uh, <laughs> <laughs> look at this now pointing he's, at us he knows he's got it now Phil in the bag and he's going to enjoy every moment of this this is a piece of history in cycling because he will equal the record of four wins in Paris-Roubaix by Roger de Vlaming and I wonder what the uh, often critical Roger de Vlaming will have to say about this performance well <laughs> he's got to be impressed that's for sure we've updated the record books uh, next year when Tom Bone attempts Paris-Roubaix he'll be going for the outright record of five victories in this event there's only five men other than de Vlaming and including Tom Bonin who have won it three times Octave Lapice in the early 1909, 10 and 11 the great sprinter from Belgium Rick Van Looy in 61, 62, 65 and of course the legendary Eddie Merckx in 68, 70 and 73 and that great Italian three times straight Francesca Moser 78 through 80 and now Tom Bonin is about to improve on 05, 08, 09 it'll shortly be 12 as well he'll switch to the left of the road down the centre of the road the last stretch of cobblestones before he enters the stadium Bonin knows he's won he's already celebrating you know these people Phil they've come out of the cafes which uh, litter the side of the road here to enjoy this man coming by live they realise what a performance he's put in talk about an athletic performance by Tom Bonin here this afternoon there you go four four is the number of victories he's going to take here when he comes onto the velodrome as he's gone over this last section of cobblestones the ornamental section of cobblestones in the Krupoland four times the last stretch of cobblestones the end of all of the 27 sectors as we reach sector one the kite ahead is one kilometer just over half a mile to the actual finish the crowd are cheering home a 56th year of a Belgian victory here as they swing towards the stadium shortly we are going to hear the roof off the stadium the last few meters and he's on the hallowed concrete surface of the Roubaix Velodrome. Tom Bonin brings it home yet again for a record equaling fourth time. There's the track. Now listen to the welcome. He comes into the home straight to receive the bell for one lap to go. He's already saluting the crowd. This has been a champion victory by a champion bike rider. i got to say, Phil, there is no way to win Paris-Roubaix but like this for Tom Bowden. It really is an historic move that he made, a brave move. Some would have said maybe a silly move, but it's paid this afternoon. He has dominated Paris-Roubaix and he's going to enjoy every moment of this. And I'm sure tonight he'd probably enjoy a very, very good Belgian beer. Tornado Tom has blown an ill wind over the rest of Paris-Roubaix as he lines up for the finish now. He equals the record of four victories of Roger de Vlaming, another great Belgian cyclist, and Tom could have a few more in him yet. He wins, but the speed, 43.48, is not a record average. He's not worried about that, Phil. These guys now are worried about who's going to finish second and third. Who is going to get on the podium here this afternoon? Alessandro Balan is not that much of a sprinter, you know, but he will have to do whatever he can. You know, you can take the banking to your advantage, but it's a strange sprint here. And if you start too soon, a lot of riders get overtaken in the last few meters if you misjudge your effort so while Bonan celebrates in the center of the track the race and there he is with Wilfred Peters 
His manager in the car, the chap on the left there going to camera was Patrick Lefebvre. That's the 11th man in 18 years he's seen on his charge win Paddy Roubaix. We're now looking for the sprint for second place. I think the best sprinter is the man at the front, but he shouldn't be at the front at this stage. One lap to go. Lars Boom comes from cyclocross background. He's been the champion of Holland for 10 years in a row. And now you can see, and in fact, look at this. All of a sudden, we're uh -oh. about to change the tactics because Nicky Terpstra has come back. He's number 15. He's the teammate. And there on the back, there is Sebastian Turgo in the green. All of a sudden, the dynamics have changed. And they most certainly have. And uh, Turgo is a Frenchman, remember? And he could get second here because he can sprint. The sprint has been opened. Now, Juan Antonio Fletcher has got the lead. Turgo has got the best position position but watch out for Bolan on the banking in red as they come off towards the finish Juan Antonio Fletcher goes as Turgo got it on the straight because this will be a great result by far and away his best ever finish he caught them on the track Bolan is coming on the line it is desperately close but I think Turgo how about you well I don't know Phil it was so close on the line it was the lunge for the line we need to see the uh, photo because Bolan looked to me as if he might just have gone over there in the last moment so there is the winner indicating four victories and that well was the most confident victory i've ever seen in his 118 tom bonan do now watch the line at the front wheel well i still don't know <laughs> <laughs> it is i still very, don't know we'll have to wait indeed. for that but it looked to me as though Turgo may have held on. This is the welcome. Wilfred Peters himself here, who's patting the back of Tom Bonan, has finished third in this race in the past. But that was a win. And then Patrick Lefebvre steps in with his 11th winner in 18 years of this race on his team. Well, there's Still not sure here. <laughs> An incredibly good finish by uh, Balan on the left. Uh, but no help from that picture at all. We need to see the front <laughs> wheel. Well, this is the next group coming in. Last year's winner there, Johan van Sommeren in the uh, blue jersey, blue jersey in the blue helmet in second position. He comes up there. Good ride by van Sommeren. Tremendous defence of his title because he's been in the pictures all of the way. Well, I think uh, we, uh, we're looking here at Matteo Tossato. He should be a man who's got a good chance of getting himself the victory in the sprint here. He used to be a great lead-out man for many, many years for guys like Mario Cipollini. Tossato leading out, though. That's Martin Vainons on his back wheel. As a move coming up, this is Le Danu, who had the bad luck in the white in third place now. The Frenchman who had that back wheel puncture and that put him out of the chase for the race for second place. But it looks as though Tosato has got this ball and he's made it look a rather a formality. He's a good sprinter. He's being challenged at the moment, but I think he should just... Oh, will he? Yes, just about makes it. Matteo Tosato of Saxo Bank. He gets, I think, we're sixth place. I'm not too yeah, sure. Yeah, just ahead of uh, Matty Heyman there. Well, they're giving it to Turgo at the moment. I think uh, that is probably correct, as Balan will be given third, uh, which is better than his fourth, and he's had a third before in this event as well. Looking down on the stadium, the bell keeps tolling for the riders as they come in. And there it is. Well, you know, I they're think giving it to the rider nearest the camera, but they look dead heat to me. It looks... I tell you one thing, Phil, they're going to have to have a very good look at that photograph afterwards. It will go to the photo finish. They've popped up those two well, riders, but it may me, well be a dead heat. I think that's the furthest result is a dead heat per second, which would be amazing. Well, they're going to have to uh, magnify the, uh, the finish there. As we're watching now, the riders who have survived the crossing of the Queen of the Classics, secret weapons, the cobblestones, as they come home one by one. And the riders just finishing there. Taylor Finney, I think it was, just getting in the places there. It looked like Taylor Finney. That's take your hats off to Taylor. Yep. A young rider like that surviving such a high finish. Taylor Finney finishing there and doing extremely well. His mum and dad will be ecstatic and they're here. Five minutes has gone by since the race came in and we just beat the six hours with five hours and 55 minutes today. Well, There's Chavanel coming in with uh, Gregory Rast. Oh, no, it's not Gregory Rast, in fact. Just coming in there, Paul. It's Hayden Rolston. Rowley. Rowley from New Zealand Hayden comes Rolston in there. From and, New uh, Zealand. Bad luck, really, I'd have to say, for Sylvain Chavanel there, Phil, because uh, a badly timed per flat tyre. He waited at the side of the road for a good uh, one and a half minutes. Looks like uh, Heinrich Hausler is going to be the next man in with this group. 
but no doubt who the winner was with a lot of daylight between him and the race for second place Heinrich Hausler of Garmin Barracuda tucked in in second place here yeah Tyler Farris in Tyler second Farris place Tyler just behind him in third Yeah, that's Tyler Farah there in second position. It is Third indeed, position yeah. is uh, Heinrich Hauslet, number four. A little bit further back, number 101. One of the riders from Vacon Soleil. And this is the big acceleration coming from uh, Team Coffee Dish in the red. And it looks as though they're two good sprinters, uh, Farah and Hausler. Farah's going with the move, but I don't think Heinrich is too interested now because he's not racing for a big finish uh, now at this stage of the race. It's six minutes since the win across the line. That's Farah, actually. Tyler Farah getting second across the line from that group, so he's got himself through Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon. He's top 20 at the moment. The race will never lose its real title from Paris to Roubaix, although these days it starts uh, 50 miles north of Paris in the town of Compiègne. Uh, there is the situation, a bone in the winner. Turgo is still given second place. Ballon, Fletcher, Terpster, Bohm. That's the order of finish in Paris-Roubaix at the moment. Johan van Sommeren, the defending champion, has crossed the line in ninth place with Martin Vainens completing the top ten overall. Well, just how has the peloton been destroyed in the last 50, 60 kilometres of racing today? There's a moment they all think they're in with a chance and then in a matter of kilometres the cobblestones have had their say and they're all split up. George Hincapie in this group just sitting dead centre in the black and white as he comes home. Hincapie wears 33 and another Paris-Roubaix under his belt. This remarkable man who just loves riding a bike at the highest level, I must say. Well, BMC, I think, could be fairly happy with their race here this afternoon, Phil, because uh, at least they managed to, uh, like they did last week, get their man onto the podium. The World Tour uh, classification after Paris-Roubaix, Tom Bonin uh, now getting himself a very large advantage there with 366 points ahead of the Australian rider from Green Edge, Simon Gerrans. Sammy Sanchez of Euskatel Euskadi up there in third place. Peter Sagan at just 22 years of age is in the top five but today for me the story has been that four victories in Paris-Roubaix for Tom Bonin and look at that smile yes I think he's just so delighted with the way he won the race and the make it four is very special he's a top star in his home country of Belgium because cycling is a number one sport in that country this man is going to have some reception when he crosses the border tonight and the headlines tomorrow he's going to eclipse the newsstand with the way he won Paris Roubaix such a demonstration of talent and strength I think what's more important Phil is the fact that he didn't need to do it he could have waited and sat in the main field but he wanted to do honor to this race which is a race from years gone by it's historic it's old and for me Tom Bonin did something very special here this afternoon in winning it in the manner that he did that was the uh, the welcome as Wilfred Peters knows exactly what Tom Bonin has achieved he's done it himself over the years we've seen some great riders do that very same signal but not with four fingers but with three riders like Johan Museo Francesca Moser Eddie Merckx but he's the only one except of course uh, Roger de Vlaming to do it with four I wonder if it'll be five next year. It wouldn't surprise me in the least. He's now won 118 bike races and he's having that very, very special start to his career, uh, to his season this year, as Bonin now has won nine races this year. Now, it's not the, uh, won't be his biggest uh, season for victories. He won 16 races back in 2008, uh, but I don't think he's ever won nine races. In fact, I'm certain he's never won nine races by the second week of April which has only just started today, Easter Sunday here in Roubaix. Tom, a bike rider like you didn't have to make a move like that. Why did you make that move at 55 kilometers to go? <laughs> because I can. <laughs> I had no choice, I think. Uh, I had no choice. I, was, I, wasn't, that, uh, I wasn't really planning on, on going solo, but at that moment when I, when, I, when I got in front with Niki, I said, uh, okay, let's try. I mean, it was nice to 
to try to make a, a little numero. Uh, if you have to ride in the back or you have to ride in front, it's the same. And if we would have stayed together with that group, we had we had to ride anyway. But then at a certain moment, Nikki Nikki dropped, and uh, I was by myself, and I just said, okay, let's let's go, let's try it. When you dropped in, did any time did you think maybe I should wait for him because it's much better to have two riders to try and go to the finish? It was still long, eh? And if you already got dropped there, you would have for sure got dropped anywhere else. So uh, I think it was the best option to go solo. It's an incredible performance by you, 55 kilometers, sort of the kind of thing that Fabian Cancellara would have done. Do you realize what sort of a monumental ride you did today? <laughs> I think I have to look at it. Uh... I know I was feeling very good the last few weeks, but uh, you know I always have my sprint as a, as, a, as a big weapon, so I don't have to do these kind of things. But I think today uh, was a nice opportunity to try it. The shape was there, and also to do a fourth victory in Paris Roubaix uh, on this way, it really shows uh, shows that I am. This is my race. You know, it's, it's a great ride that you did today. But uh, to win like that, is that something very special for you today? Yeah, yeah this is my my best victory ever. Thanks. Special record last week, 17 finishes in the Tour of Flanders, and uh, today, Pai Roubaix, you're still up there with the team. Yeah, I had some unfortunate incidents, a couple of crashes, or well, one crash, a couple of flats, had some inopportune moments, um, but the team rode great. Uh, you know, we're on the podium again. Uh, it's, uh, it's good, you know, we, of course, we want to win, but uh, third place in one of the biggest races in the world is something to be proud of. What about this youngster, Taylor Finney? I mean, uh, you know, he's ridden Paris River before as a, as a youngster, but coming in here at the big time, uh, were you impressed with him today? Taylor was awesome. I got my money on him to be the first American to win Paris Rube. He, he did a lot of work for the team, and he was still up there at the end and a couple of days, and um, I was really impressed with his ride today. A youngster like him, does that give you the, the, the desire to, to keep racing, to keep there, to, to pass on all the information that you've got over the years to, to the young guys coming up? It's probably not a good time to ask me if I want to keep racing, especially after how I feel. Um, but everybody's feeling tired right now. And, um, you know, I'm just really fortunate and happy to be part of this team. This team is really helping, keeping me motivated. And, you know, guys like Taylor, um, so enthusiastic and just, just, just fun to be around. So it's definitely helping me. Uh, uh, continue to, to race. One last word, what about Tom Bone? And that was a pretty impressive ride today. Absolutely, Tom is on fire. He's won what the last four or five races he's done. So he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, on, he's on fire right now. Former teammate of yours, in fact, he made his name riding alongside you. Yes, yeah, back in the day, he's, uh, he's made quite a career for himself. All right, thanks, Paul. Special record last week, 17 finishes in the Tour of Flanders. And uh, today, Paris Roubaix, you're still up there with the team. Yeah, I had some unfortunate incidents, a couple of crashes, or well, one crash, a couple of flats. Had some inopportune moments, um, but the team rode great. Uh, you know, we're on the podium again. Uh, it's uh, it's good. You know, we of course we want to win, but uh, third place in one of the biggest races in the world is something to be proud of. What about this youngster Taylor Finney? I mean, uh, you know, he's ridden Paris River before as a, as a youngster, but coming in here at the big time. Uh, were you impressed with him today? Taylor was awesome. I got my money on him to be the first American to win Paris Bay. He he did a lot of work for the team, and he was still up there at the end. And you know, he was he was really motivated. And we roomed together the last couple of days. And um, I was really impressed with his ride today. A youngster like him, does that give you the, the, the desire to, to keep racing, to keep there, to, to pass on all the information that you've got over the years to, to the young guys coming up? It's probably not a good time to ask me if I want to keep racing, especially after how I feel. Um, but everybody's feeling tired right now. And, um, you know, I'm just really fortunate and happy to be part of this team. This team is really helping, keeping me motivated. And, you know, guys like Taylor, um, so enthusiastic and just, just, just fun to be around. So it's definitely helping me... Uh, uh, continue to, to race. One last word, what about Tom Bone? And that was a pretty impressive ride today. Absolutely, Tom is on fire. He's won what the last four or five races he's done. So he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, on, he's on fire right now. Former teammate of yours, in fact, he made his name riding alongside you. Yes, yeah, back in the day, he's, uh, he's made quite a career for himself. All right, thanks, Paul. Well, Taylor, I know you've been to Paris River before as a, as a youngster, but this is the big time, this was the big game. Uh, what was it like out there? Ah, it was quite difficult, epic, you know, as expected. It's my favorite race. I love this race to death. And so uh, to be able to be up there and, and help the guys, you know, I know Balan would have liked one step up on the podium than second, but 
as a team we have to, we have to be happy with that and and personally I, I did a fair amount of work and and had a had a really good race um finished in the top 20 and that's pretty special for me i just entering that velodrome is just the best thing ever i love it what do you think when a guy like george hincapie with the experience of george hincapie says taylor finney's going to be the first american to win paris roubaix well, I mean, this you know, obviously, pretty it's pretty special to hear that. George is George and I've uh, become really close this year. You know, we roomed at training camp, and we've been rooming all through the classics uh, together. And so, you know, he's he's a great guy, and, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can from him. And uh, you know, I hope I hope he sticks around for uh, for another couple of years. But I can't really ask him to do that. It's a, it's a big race, Paris Roubaix. It's a special race. So, what makes it different to any other races? You've got to be a, a special bike rider to be motivated by it, don't you? Yeah, it kind of takes a, an ounce of craziness to like just being jarred by the cobbles at all times. Um, but some, something about it, I like it. And, uh, you know, it's just you're fighting from kilometer zero with everybody around you. I was talking with Stegman today, and he was telling me that he's just like, yeah, this is the most stressful race ever. I've never said the F word to anybody as much as I do in this race. And I was like, all right, well, I'll try not to piss you off. What about uh, mom and dad? They're reliving their uh, cycling careers through you nowadays because I'm sure uh, your dad, definitely Davis, he, he gets excited about races like this. Yeah, I haven't seen um, I haven't seen my dad uh, or my sister since uh, January, and so to have them over here, um, you know, my mom comes over a little more frequently because she kind of helps me to live properly while I'm in Italy. But um, to have them over here is, is really special for me, and and I know they get excited by uh, seeing me up in the front and uh, watching me on TV, and they got to follow in the second follow car today, which meant that they got to see a couple sections and. That's uh, you know huge for them and, and really really cool for me when I'm plugging away and I can hear my dad screaming "Go Taylor!" Thank you. So as the uh, we have witnessed today, an incredibly good Paris Bay, the 110th edition of Paris Bay 2012, won by Tom Bonin. As Tom Bonin now comes onto the podium, as he. He's congratulated there by Bernard Eno, the great French cyclist who once won this race. The cheers are all for the Belgian ace. Tom Bonin wins for the fourth time. So there are now two riders who've won this uh, Queen of the Classics four times. Uh, Roger de Vlamanque and now Tom Bonin, they're both Belgian riders. A hugely proud moment for the man who demonstrated today he really is the best one day rider of the moment. And there it is, the cobblestone. You need both hands to hold that one. A little bit of weight training now, Tom. So as uh, Tom Bonin salutes the crowd as winner, we say goodbye from Roubaix and uh, join us again. And will Tom Bonin win again next year? Well, we'll have to wait and see. For Paul Sherwin, I'm Phil Liggett saying goodbye for now.